is this you first, Jason? Me first, sure. All right, great. Okay. Yeah, I can you just right. smack me when you want me to turn the, turn the slide. I don't know everybody, so I'm just going to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Jason Gaylord, director of the Randolph Technical Career Center. Nice to meet you all. So, um, senior data for this year. Um, in September, we did senior data for last year, so I had the data for this year, so I can use this year's numbers. Um, one thing I wanted to point out that we'll be serving instead of seven center schools next year, we have, we're down to four. Um, so Northfield and Williamstown are becoming one district. So that's two. Randolph is three, and Whitcomb South Royalton joined. That's four. Mm -hmm. um, Chelsea Rochester closed in their school choice. So if a student lives in that area, they're still able to come to us based upon statute. So even if they go to Sharon Academy based upon where they live, um, they should still really enroll in their tech center. So. We're down. Um, we had 20, you can see the numbers of the total seniors we had this year. Um, right now we're around 135 total students for next year, which is great. Um, it's a little more than this year, um, but that's about our six year average. Um, 18 students, uh, female that are in non-traditional programs, so that might be digital film, building trades, diesel, auto, uh, forestry, and agriculture. Um, 21 of our seniors are on the economically disadvantaged spectrum. 30% of our senior class is on an IEP or 504 plan. Uh, 25 out of the total are going on to post-secondary education, including these schools. Um, what's great is that um, five of our students in health careers are going into the nursing program at Norwich University, so that's really great. That's great. Um, and one is accepted to Norwich, just not in the nursing program yet, so six out of, out of 15. Um, this year, I think we have one who's in the process of applying now to the Coast Guard, but unusual for us, we don't have a lot of students um, applying to the military. Um, 18 are working in their field, and 14 out of the total are going to be working. So that's almost close to 100%, which is pretty good. Um, we have, actually this year, <laughs> we have 311 industry recognized certificates for our center. And so out of that 311, all of those are approved by the Agency of Education. As a center, though, we have over 600 industry recognized certificates. So some sometimes aren't registered by the AOE, which is great. So like in our diesel program, we have one student who got over 125 Peterbilt and Freightliner certificates. Those just aren't registered by the AOE. But for the industry, he can go to Lucky's, he can go to Peterbilt, he can go to um, another diesel place and, and really get a lot of jobs. So it's great for us. Um, we've increased our dual enrollment. 36 seniors in dual enrollment college credits. When I first started, I think we were down around 12, 14 percent, um, and this year we're much higher than that. About 30, some, about 30 some odd percent. So we've almost tripled that in the last three years. Um, and students can get up to 12 college credits with us versus high school, they can get six. Um, so it's really great. We're pretty proud of that. 36 out of 65 worst based learning, um, 15 seniors on National Technical Honor Society, and 15 are in technical excellence. Um, I tried to give you some discipline data. So one behavior contract, one report of the seniors now just for bullying, um, but four in the five of harassment and kind of uh, disciplinary racial language. We did four out of school suspensions, two in school, not a lot of theft this year. Um, from the seniors, which is great, no smoking and vaping, yay. <laughs> so that was good, a couple juniors. Um, a couple, um, I put physical, because we didn't have a really like what we consider fighting, but some inappropriate touching. Um, no safety violations, which is great, um, and two for improper technology and internet, which would also go back up to harassment and bullying and be included in that. So, um, and this is the second year we started tracking discipline data. I didn't do that my first year. And then just some outcomes that we're working on for next year. We're really working hard on this 100% student placement. The Agency of Education really wants us as a center to bulk our Students who are going on to post-secondary education or training up to 40%, and so we're about 12% shy of that, so that's something that we're gonna to work towards next year. Um, and in this area, as you know, you know, there's a lot of poverty and a little trauma, so that's really gonna be a challenge for us, but we'll get there. Um, our college and career lab's been great this year. Every Friday, we've had a guest speaker in, um, in one program or the other. 
And so we're going to continue that pattern and build that up. Um, this year, last year we read as a school bridges out of poverty. This year we're going to read disrupting poverty. Um, and we'll continue to find ways to offset that and figure out how we can connect students to college and training pathways or, or jobs. Um, we're going to continue our mentoring process. And we're working on an update for a technical project. Um, we'll run that by Elijah and Lee. Um, but we're going to move towards more of a digital portfolio process with a platform called Prodeum. It's through the Vermont Tarrant Institute at a UVM. Um, and it's going to connect what they do by setting goals. Um, and that way a student will walk away with their digital platform. And then we'll still do an open house. So we're still kind of finalizing that. That's what I had. Questions? Question. Jason? Anything missing that you'd like to see next time? Anything you're interested in? Yes, Elijah. Jason, is this was this a focus on this year's graduate this year's, or last year's graduate? This year's going to graduate seniors. I had that data, so I just that's what I wanted to look at. I'm trying to think of an intelligent question. No, it could, not. it could be any kind of question. <laughs> Anything you're curious about. I'm just wondering if there's anything that you're concerned or worried about. As you look at this data, do you see holes and say, really, this um, is what we should be doing? What do I look and think about? So we're hiring a full-time math teacher for next year. Um, the Agency of Education, this is what we talk about on our board, is that they're moving, as they review all tech centers, the Agency of Education, let's see if I can back this up. We're graded on a, a scope of different things, and they've used literacy and math data from SBACs for the past five, six years. And now that SBACs have moved to ninth grade, they still haven't told us what they're going to measure us on in literacy and math. So we don't know what we're going to be evaluated on for the 2018-19 school year. So there's a hole in that, and that we're not sure what tool we're going to be measured by. That's so in anticipation, yeah, it's kind of weird. No, so, that sounds pretty typical, actually, right, isn't it? Um, I think for us, <laughs> we would know, because there's only 17 of oh, us, okay. right, tech centers. Yes, I'm just thinking over the course of, you know, 10, 15 years, the way pe students are evaluated by the right. state and national change is so many times. Right. But for us, we're so small. Right. Um, we're easy to deal with. So in, in anticipation of that, we've hired a math teacher. We know we need to work on our math scores. As a center, we know our students come in weak. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's something we want to improve on. So in anticipation of that, I think we're going to look towards, most likely, um, it's called WorkKeys. And it's a, a tool that students use through the ACT to do literacy and math skills. And they can get a certificate out. And I think that's the way the AOE is going to go. And so in anticipation of next year, that's something that We'll have pre and post data I'm hoping for, for a whole school year, and then we'll be able to see what we do with that. Um, and I think we're not going to have one direct route, you know, using SBAC scores or NECAP science as a way to measure students. So we know there's a hole in math and literacy, we keep working towards it, but we also know that this is an obstacle for students yeah. to learn, and so we're hoping if we can address this as well, it all tends to balance out over time. I was actually surprised at your poverty da data that it was only 30%. I would have guessed more. I would guess more, and that's off free and reduced lunch, and that's only for this senior class. Mm -hmm. and so not including junior data. I think as a school we're in the 40 percentile. Except for Brookfield, it's just 30. Um, Everybody else is trying 40. Right. But that also doesn't include students who don't fill out the forms. Right. And, and, so, um, and I think what, what will be difficult, not difficult, but what would be a good challenge is if the a Agency of Education wants us to hit this 40% mark of students who go to college or, t or other training, um, that's a big leap. And I think at the same time, we promote a lot of opportunities for students to get training and great paying jobs without having to go to college. So if we look at the GW or GE Aviation Plan where they pay $25 an hour and pay for you to go to school, I think that's just as valuable as trying to make a 40% mandate that may not be reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so either, either way, the math was the key. because uh, I think the math is the key. Because the student, what we find, right, is the student is going to need the math to take their AccuPlace or ACT, SAT skills for college, mm -hmm. or they're going to need the math to pass that Algebra 2 test to get into GE, GW. Right. So either way, we know we need to improve our math. So that's OK. We feel good about that. You had exactly what I was going to say. Oh. <laughs> do you have an update on the advanced manufacturing? What kind of update? So we have our teacher. Do you have oh, a teacher? Do you have students? We have seven students. Seven. And we're grant. getting more every day. 
you are. Said, well, in this in the sense of we keep getting more questions, more applications. So I feel good about that. Seven hard so seven, seven students hard have signed students. up. Is seven that seven more students have been accepted. Okay. I can't tell you if they're gonna show up day yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. Right. And last year I learned, you know, I keep this data. Well, it's better than one, which sure. is the other program. <laughs> we have one more. Yeah, last couple of years. Um, <laughs> but in here I did give you the data on how many students did not show this year, day one, which was 10, mm, right? Wow. So that was in your packet. So it was 10 students who were accepted, but day one never wow. stepped through the door, right? And so that, that's a hard thing for us. That's but we're also higher numbers this year than we were at this point last year, mm. okay? So we have seven students um, accepted to advanced manufacturing. We just got approval last Thursday, Friday, last week. Uh, for a program innovation grant for $75,000 for one year um, for that program, which will help offset some nice wow. equipment costs. Yeah. Cool. And so we have our teacher, he's ready. We have our syllabus, program of study, seven students, uh, NIM certificates, they've worked at DW, LED, we're ready to go. Perfect. Yeah, I feel good about it. I think we've hired the right, I know we've hired the right person. Good. That's absolutely That's wonderful. Sure. So I'm excited for that. Um, and I think as of Monday, they're supposed to start demolition Room. Oh wow! So, so hopefully that waste no also. time. Yeah, the awesome. facilities updates got a lot of the listings on what they're working on. So, so mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I know for today. Plumbing and walls on Monday. <laughs> they wanted to start tomorrow, but I said no. Any <laughs> um, I wanted the yeah. students out when they, they start. Not too noisy. Makes sense. Any other kinds of questions? All right. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. And Elijah. Are you a chess? for the opportunity to reflect with you on actually last year's senior class. <laughs> we focus one, one year back because uh, for our current seniors, at least at this point in the year, we don't have all of the data compiled that we have compiled for the past grades. So we could revisit the timeline for this presentation if we want to bump it into the fall. Um, when we'll have SAT data and a uh, AP scores and other statistics that might be of interest. Um, so I'll just quickly talk you through the packet that we have here. This is a, a grid where we keep some of the longitudinal information about our graduating classes, and um, I chose to highlight a couple of the a couple of the trends in the handout here. Um, so I'm going to flip from the top page into the next page, which is. Um, which has some of the data and a graph about our four-year graduation rate. And maybe I, I can wait till all the paper gets moved Sorry, around. That's okay. Ready? ready? Okay. So I'm looking at this page right here. Um, I already I already sent them back that way actually. Um, so you can see from the, um, the graph plots the Randolph Union four-year graduation rate and the Vermont four-year graduation rate average. Randolph Union's in blue, Vermont is in red. And you can see that um, starting with the graduating class of, or started, yeah, starting with the graduating class of 2016, our graduation rate takes a jump up into 90, 95% and surpassing the state average. And that trend of surpassing the state average has continued for the last three years, and we think it will continue for this year's graduating class as well. Um, the way I understand that and the way I tell that story is by trying to see where in the last five years or so we have undertaken some major reforms. And I trace, that, um, I trace that jump in the graduation rate to some of our advisory reforms and to some of our, our reforms in terms of um, community engagement and relevance in the curriculum. So our relationship reforms and our relevance reforms, which I would argue have not been undertaken at this, at to, um, to the detriment of the rigor of the, of the academic program, given the kinds of schools that our students are still getting into. That said, some of the other pages that we'll look at suggest we have work to do in that area as well. Um, 
the, the class of 2016, when they were freshmen, that's when we first started some of our substantial advisory reforms, adding additional time, asking the cohorts to stay with the same advisor over multiple years, infusing student-led conferences and portfolios into the advisory work. Um, that wasn't when we carved out too m it wasn't it wasn't the schedule reform of the last two years, um, but it was the start of that advisory focus. Um, and then when that class of 2016 were, were when they were sophomores, that's when we started the, the PBL lab and Ken first started his first class with GW Plastics. And across the school, there was more of an effort to, to push the curriculum in the direction of community engagement and real world relevance. Um, also, over that period of time, um, Dave and I and our colleagues have worked to hire the best possible teachers that we can attract from across the country and across Vermont. And even though our hiring pool is typically small, we've learned how to attract strong candidates and keep them interested in the work um, all through the hiring process and ultimately to bring some of them, like Josh and others, to, um, to our school. So I'm proud of, the, of those reforms and what I see as a jump in the graduation rate because students, I think, feel more engaged in the learning, that's the relevance, and feel um, cared for and understood, and they, that's the relationships. And the faculty also, through those relationships, go the extra mile to work with the children and the families who in past years would have, been, would have dropped out or might have been pushed out. It's not happening anymore. Um, I did have an odd question. Yep. Why is the state average so stable? That just doesn't look. Uh, well, that's that's the average over the course of those years. So I didn't. Okay. I, didn't, I, I didn't, just it looked kind of flat. <laughs> <laughs> and just my yeah. brain was like, that's that's odd. Not not calling it into question from you, but from this different. So yeah. is this average over a time frame? Is it, was it 87% every single year from? I don't remember. when I, I calculated it last year, Brooke, so I have to go back and look. <laughs> okay. Um, just, yeah, you know. It's probably not. Probably but, it, but I'm sure the actual state, you're, you're right to point that out. The actual state averages for every individual year wouldn't be right. 87% every year. Why I was, that's why I was just thinking, you know, in relation to the year to year, that would make a more of a valid comparison, wouldn't it? Yeah, I can definitely take okay. a fresh I just, look at I'm that. not not criticizing at all that's just my and just for comparison national averages for graduation rates in the united states tend to be around 60 percent give or take a little bit yeah vermont's higher thank you for pointing that out um, if we flip we'll look at some of the sat data from the last couple of years um, it's broken out by um, reading writing and math the randolph union average scores for the senior class the Vermont average scores and the uh, for the SAT and the national average scores. Um, in terms of reading, Randolph Union, this, this, the senior classes over the past three years have been consistently at or above the state and national averages in reading. Um, if you want the specific numbers there to the left. In terms of writing, two of the last three years we've been above the state and national averages in writing. And in terms of math, two of the three years we were at or above the national average. Two of the three years, we were below the state average in SAT math. Um, and being below the state average in some of our standardized test scores in math is something, of course, that we see in the SBAC data as well um, from year to year. We can return to any of these pages. I'll just quickly walk us through them. The, the next page is the AP exams. Um, I've given you the, the percentage of students who took an exam in a given year. So this actually is a mix of juniors and seniors in any given year. Um, but I still think it's, it's worth talking about it in terms of our senior profile, our upper grades. I'll give you the percentage getting three, four, or five, and the percentage of the class that took the exam, because I think that's interesting to note. Um, we can note that over the last eight years, more students have been taking AP exams. So even while our, our school population is declining a bit, the number of students taking AP exams is increasing. Um, we also, in the past two or three years, have, have decided to pay for the exam for students who we think will struggle to pay for it, and to require students to take the exam if they're in the class. In the above data, you'll note that the highest pass rate on the exams was achieved in the year that the smallest percentage of the class took the exams, so perhaps a more self-selecting uh, group. Um, 
In terms of improvements this year, because we, we, we have plenty of improvements to make in our AP exam scores, um, we created, Dave in particular, working with the AP teachers, created a calendar of, of callback time. That's, that's an extra one to two hours a week, depending on how it's used for AP classes, so that the AP classes rotated through the year and got dedicated extra time with students. Um, we also um, made, a, made a different teaching assignment for AP Calc based on, what, based on the strong interest of the teacher and also based on the strong qualifications. Um, and in terms of challenges, um, challenges for this year, we don't have our AP scores yet, but it's been a challenge having one of our, um, one of our AP teachers happens to be out on, uh, on maternity leave, and so a long-term sub in place of the AP teacher it just creates a, can create a different classroom atmosphere for the last quarter of the year in that, in that particular class. Um, in general, to, 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 to answer the question that, that, to respond to the question that Laura asked Jason, um, I see plenty of room, of course, for improvement in terms of these standardized um, measures of student achievement, in terms of the AP um, tests and in terms of the SATs and, um, and SBAC as well, although, although seniors and upper grades aren't, aren't taking those tests. Some of the things that I think the school needs to do better in order to address that is to better ensure that, that, that people feel responsible for those domains. And so part of the reason why I've decided with, in collaboration with the leadership team and with Lane to hire an associate principal of curriculum and instruction is it's important that there be someone in a leadership role who, spiel, who feels very responsible for academic achievement, for alignment from one year to the next, and for the scaffolding up of rigor throughout the years to ensure that there's no gap, that junior year kids don't have a lack of writing, for instance, that, 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 that the bar keeps getting raised as the students go get, get, get older and older. Um, so the AP is in part appointed to feel some responsibility for this at a whole school level with me. Um, we've also, in terms of tier two supports, meaning classes that are, that are designed to support students who need extra time or support. Um, to, to achieve proficiency. Um, those tier two supports can include a, the program that we call Project Achieve for students who need help with organization and just staying on task and being productive. It can include math labs and literacy labs where students need um, more time to, um, to, to, to learn material, either pre-teaching before they approach the material in a classroom or after it's been taught to remediate in some degree. Um, the tier two supports, um, because they include math labs, literacy labs, and project achieve, they touch upon lots of different teams in the school. You might have a seventh grade team making recommendations for students who would move into tier two support classes. You might have an eighth, and you have an eighth grade team and a ninth grade team and a tenth grade team. So that's at least four team leaders right there. And then you've got a math department, and you've got a and you've got a humanities department, and then you've got spe the special education. So you've got at least seven or eight people who, in different ways, feel responsible for tier two supports, but nobody who's looking at all of them together. And so we've moved responsibility for all of those tier two supports into the special education department next year, where we have a department chair, um, Janet West, is actually returning to the role, who is um, who understands the seventh through who understands the, the seventh and eighth grade work and the ninth grade work very, very well, who understands the needs of special education teachers, and who also uh, inter has experience interfacing with grade teams. So I think the AP of curriculum and instruction, in terms of, this, in terms of the, the universal work of the core curriculum, the moving the tier two supports under the purview of the special education department chair, and then the other thing I would add is that we haven't made this official yet, but I would like to have co-chairs in the humanities department as opposed to just one, because that's one person responsible for the oversight of a lot of stuff. Um, and I think we would benefit from having someone there with the English teacher hat and English department hat on, looking at that scope and sequence, and someone with the social studies hat. And collaborating, of course, but with some separate responsibilities for those um, different curriculum strands. So those, those are some of the things that we will be doing next year that I think will improve the degree to which um, people in leadership positions feel responsible for working with teachers and students to achieve um, better results in these areas as well as in our, our SBAC scores. And I'd also say that, that our AP of curriculum instruction will work 
uh, more closely than Dave or I has with Lane and the curriculum coaches at the OSSD level because that will be specifically part of her her domain. And I know that Lane, from things that you've said, Lane is looking forward to working with her in that regard. So one can anticipate increased alignment from the elementary schools up into the middle schools as those leadership positions work more closely together. Um, and I'm happy to talk in detail about any of this to flip back um, to any of the pages um, or to just have an open conversation with you, whatever your time permits. Can I ask you about the, <clears throat> the chart on the AP exams? Mm -hmm. Is this um, senior class? So is this the juniors were taking AP, their scores are not reported? Well, Brooke, that's a good point. I'm trying to, I was borrowing from my spreadsheet, and I was trying to get the percentage of the kids in the senior class who took the exam, but that's probably the percentage of the kids in two classes. Um, I think either way, the, the point still holds that when fewer students were taking the exam, we, were, we had our highest results. And as we've broadened the number of students who are taking the exam, as we've invited more students to take it and said, we'll pay for you to take it, um, our, our, our exam scores have, have gone down. Um, and you know, some of our rationale for doing that is as, as, we've, sh as we've shrunk as a school and shrunk in our personnel and teaching faculty, it makes sense to open up as many courses as we can to as many students as we can um, so that they have choice when they're in their upper grades. But so good point there. I think there's some, I think there's some errors actually in that, but I think the general point would still hold um, in terms of um, the selectivity of students who are taking the test. In terms of the raw number of how many kids are taking the exam, what's, yeah. the, what's the size, smallest year versus largest? I mean, I'm curious as to what kind of increase there was when we took um, the cost issue away. Um. I'm jumping back to this to mind Dave spreadsheet here. A number of seniors who took an RUAP class on the first page. You can see those raw numbers. So those actually are the, the, the seniors and not it doesn't include juniors as far as as far as I know. Um, so 24 to 17 to 15 to 11 to 21. Oh, I see. That. 23, 33, 30, 21. So from the teens and 20s to the 20s and 30s, I guess, in terms of raw numbers of kids. That's pretty significant in the class, in the class sizes we have, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd like to add to this grid um, as best we can do in terms of post-secondary tracking of college and career placement. And the, the tech centers are required to do it, and therefore they are funded and staffed to do it. Mm -hmm. We are not required to do it. And we are funded and staffed generally to work with the kids that we've got. <laughs> um, so to ask the guidance department to track down 80, add another class, 100, and, you know, mm -hmm. how many hundreds of students who are not in the school can we devote our time to tracking um, is a question. You can rely on the clearinghouse data, but there's so much error in that it's hard to say. So I'd love to have some more post-secondary data in here in terms of college. Uh, college going and college retention. Um, it's just hard to devote the resources mm -hmm. to tracking all that information down once kids leave you. Leave you. Um, I would like, it would be easy to add our senior project rubric scores so that we can see mm -hmm. who's, who's exceeding proficiency on the paper, who's exceeding proficiency on the presentations, and so we can break that out. Katie has that, so I'd like to add that in here for the past couple of years. Um, and also add the percentage of the senior class that's engaged in off-site early college and other um, dual enrollment opportunities. Because um, that, is, that is changing also in the last couple of and years. And Naviance, they still have it. They have an add-on module um, for alumni tracking, um, but you kind of depend on the students to go in and add their own data you know, after they graduated. You know, a year from now, you know, are you still at the same college that you yeah. applied to? Are you still in the same field? I think it goes out two years. Um, we tried it at one of the districts that they had it, you know, graduating class of 300, you know, we probably had 80 or 90 students that, you know, did update, update. it, so. Hmm. So, Paj, I want to ask you one other question <clears throat> about our SAT data. Um, now that Khan Academy has SAT prep uh, 
that I guess electronically can feed from your PSAT scores, for example, mm. and help you identify and study the areas that you need to improve in. Is that anything that either our advisories or our guidance office is facilitating in any way to, you know, um, yes, it's available, but maybe to train the kids or to, you know, check in with them about are you preparing properly or do we have any other kind of prep test prep before they sit for SATs? It's a good idea. We don't have any universal te test prep across the school at this point for the PSATs or for the SATs. So it's worth considering. It's possible as an elective. Um, some of the schools that I've been at, they would have a SAT English prep that the English um, department would offer and an SAT math prep, um, usually a semester and a semester. Mm -hmm. Or even get the advisors to nag a little maybe. <laughs> <laughs> some extra, extra do it. Like okay. my daughters did it every day. Yeah. Almost every day mm -hmm. they just That's not a bad idea either. You know, five minutes. Mm -hmm. okay. Good. That's Sorry. a good thing. Very good thing. That's what grade level when she was doing that? I know she did it last year. Last year in 11th grade. Yeah. I don't know if she did it this year. Mm -hmm. What else strikes you that you'd like to discuss or note or suggestions or ideas? Again, whatever your time allows. I see you're checking the ACT and SAT. Are there other standardized tests that you would rather track that you think are more, um, I, I don't know, more in line with what the outcomes we're looking for mm -hmm. or that you're looking for, the students that maybe SATs and ACTs aren't really concentrating on? Um, nothing comes to mind in terms of a different standardized test that that I would, but but our but my my colleagues might have something. Um, the, the state is requiring now, and one of the new accountability measures is that every every graduating senior will have, have participated in and met certain benchmarks in a menu mm -hmm. of assessments, um, post secondary and career um, oriented assessments, and um, for two reasons we're considering um, asking all of our students to sit for the ACT. Um, one. It's a way to just check off that participation expectation. All the students took that that one exam. Um, it also it also opens up for them um, different areas of the country in terms of what colleges are looking for, what colleges are used to. Um, and from what I understand from the guidance department, um, it's a test that it can be particularly useful for students who are interested in science and engineering uh, post secondary pursuits, um, which might dovetail nicely with many of the students at the tech center. So we're considering adopting that as, like we have all of our t sophomores take the PSAT, we might also have all of a particular cohort take the ACT. Um, and if we're doing that, it behooves us to think of things like Brooke um, was just talking about, how can we make sure they're ready for that mm -hmm. particular format? Um, and balance the readiness needs for the other standardized tests that you want to do well on, too, that have their own particular mm -hmm. ways of being taken, the SBAC and the science exam also, which is new this year. How is the SAT administered now? Is it still filling the blocks, Boy, I, or am I showing my age? <laughs> I don't know, actually. I don't read their minds. <laughs> I been, yeah, it's a they, retinal they, they, scan. They do have some short, short answer responses. And it's not computer-based, is it? Is it computer -based? Um, actually, it is in a lot of cases, but you yeah. can still um, but it's, it's interesting that um, prior to two years ago, um, it, was a, it was a bad exam to try to, to tell the performance of the school from because it was a, a reasoning test. It was an IQ test. And so technically the way that it was done was it shouldn't matter whether you had a PhD or whether you had a, a college degree or whether you were you know, a high school student. Um, your score should have always been about the same on it. Um, with the last two years and the big change that happened, they've switched over to more of a subject-based test, more along the lines of the ACT, who was their, their big um, competitor who's been coming along. ACT is always a great test because it's subject-based, right? It's testing you in your math skills up through geometry. It's testing you in your science skills up through biology. 
uh, that's testing you in your, your ELA and it gives some feedback about the content that the students have learned and about the curriculum that was delivered you know, over the course of their careers. The problem is there weren't a lot of students in our area that took it um, because SAT is typically um, on the coasts. Right? Those are the schools that are looking for SATs, Midwest, the, the middle, middle states typically will look for the ACT, so it wasn't as valuable a test um, for the kids necessarily. They um, often took it if they were afraid of the SAT, um, just because of the content base of it as opposed to the, the reasoning. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of info. Right. Other questions, thoughts? Good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so my much. pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thanks. And I, I want to talk a little bit too, um, kind of about what, what Elijah touched on. You know, in the data, if you take a look up there, we're looking at 2016 17. You know, policy governance, we're always looking backwards. Um, but of a lot of the data that, that we're starting to take a look at that might be valuable um, as we reinterpret the ends and, and what's a good measure to tell if we're achieving them um, is, is the standardized test that we have available. And a lot of that data does not come out until midsummer. Um, and then at times it'll be embargoed for a little while and it's usually not fully available for the previous year. In our case, that would be 17, 18 um, right now um, until August or September that we can put it out uh, publicly. So we, we talked a little bit at the, um, the pre-meeting about you know maybe we can shift when that big ends report is due um, to the time so that you're looking at uh, the data from the previous year as opposed to two years ago was one of the ideas. Um, currently, as it stands, we do have some of the SBAC data in mathematics and in ELA, um, but it's actually embargoed uh, until the 15th. Um, what happens is they go through and they start scoring the tests. And so every day you can go into the portal and you can see, oh, yeah, of the 60 kids that we had take the, the math ELA in this grade, you know, 42 of them have been have been scored already, and that, that's shown in this composite score. So in the early grades, we probably got about 80% of the kids that have been scored already. Um, the high school level for some re and middle school level, for some reason, in the seventh grade, there's not a lot that are showing up in there, but the others are probably about 40% done. Um, so there is, is data, but we can't share the current data quite yet. Um, so kind of going forward uh, is maybe looking at an August or a September date for the, um, for the mo monitoring report. Uh, and this way, the other thing too is maybe break up um, the presentations that go along with it so the report can be all done in one shot, but break up the presentations kind of like we do for the, the limitations reports, you know, do one or, one or two here of those ends. Um, for the purpose of this idea that everything that goes on in this district, whether it's the faculty, whether it's the programs that we put in place, um, the, the equipment that we buy, it's all really geared towards making sure that we're meeting those ends. And so it seems like we should be spending a little bit more time on it, examining it, analyzing it um, together as a group than just you know, one, one big day you know, once a year. We um, usually have several um, this, this type of presentation good. in a year. I can't remember how many, and I don't have the classes to say this now. You need to print. Um, we should, I think it's definitely worth you know, moving both, both, all of these, really. I guess Jason's was ready, but yeah. the rest of the data to it later either yeah. August or September date. Yeah, there's, uh, there's the in-house data, which we can get at, at any time, but sometimes when we're, we're depending on the, um, depending on the, uh, the standardized testing, you know, you gotta wait until the scoring's done and then they take the embargoes off to, to be able to share it. Um, but a lot of today is about looking at, at two of the ends as, as best we can, and that's the mathematics and the ELA. Um, we have been talking a little bit, uh, started off at the last cabinet meeting, um, about you know what are some other more academic ways, some more academic based tools um, that we can find to actually assess our performance on these ends. Um, reading and mathematics uh, was an easy one because we've got the SBAC that's readily available, um, but more important in terms of that actual test, 
Uh, it's actually used for our accountability with the federal government. It's used for our accountability with the state government. Um, it's also what people look to, and it's easy, the data is easy to find if they're deciding to move into Randolph, you know, for its educational system. Mm -hmm. And it's also what people are looking to as they make decisions about school choice, considering the number of school closings that we've had uh, in and around us um, over the course of this past year. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's well worth our time to take a focus on this. Um, in fact, a lot of the, the title funding decisions are, are based upon um, our performance uh, in terms of SBAC. So useful data. So as we're having the discussions with the cabinet about uh, ways to kind of reinterpret the ends and what is useful data uh, to look at to see how well we're meeting them, um, a couple of the criteria here that we're examining is this idea that it must be valid, right? It's actually got to be measuring what it is that you want it to measure. If I'm using SBAC to test students in the math curriculum, but the math curriculum isn't aligned to the SBAC and its requirements, then the question becomes, this is not a valid tool, right? Because what is it that it's actually telling me? I don't know. So it doesn't become valid. So that's part of the reason for some of the curriculum work that we've discussed over the course of the year. Um, it must be reliable. Um, in other words, it doesn't matter whether I give that assessment tool to the students or you give the assessment tool to the students. Um, everything being the same, their scores should be about the same. Right? And a lot of the, the tools that have been used previously, um, they are some very good tools, um, but they're not really calibrated. Uh, and the kids that we're complaining about that this year, especially with the rubrics like with Habits of Heart and Habits of Mind, they need to be calibrated because if I go into your class, I'm here. If I go into your class, I'm here. And so how do we reconcile that? How do we make sure that every, everything is, is, is kind of connected to, together? And then again, the idea, the ends of all things, is making sure um, that we're constantly keeping our minds on what we're producing because everything that we've got in this district should be geared towards meeting those ends in one, one way, shape, or form or another. Um, throw this up here and then talk about the pieces before we kind of jump into it. Um, the math composite score, uh, remembering that the data has changed over the course of time. It used to be NECAP. Mm -hmm. And about two years ago, uh, they switched over to the, the Smarter Balanced Assessment, the SBAC. Um, so that's the reason that there are two years of dates up here. I did do a three-year look at NECAP scores in Mathematic, and the trend is the same. And so let me talk a little bit about what this is showing you. Um, up until this year, right, the, it took uh, the exam, the SBAC uh, exam in Mathematics and, and English in grades 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 11. Right, so you had a pretty good stretch here where they're getting tested every year, mm -hmm. um, and then you have a, a couple of year gap before they get their final um, testing and this their final assessment in 11th grade. Uh, what this is, is this is, is telling you the number percentage that met the proficiency threshold. Mm -hmm. So for third graders who took the, the uh, math uh, SBAC in 2016, so that would be 2015, 2016, 67% of them met that threshold or above that proficiency threshold. Before we get to the graph, because they're not showing you the same data, um, they're looking at it in kind of different terms, we can talk about the chart. I like the chart because what the chart allows you to do at least a little bit is it allows you to follow what happens to kids at least over the course of a year, right? We started out here, this is our score, a year later this is where we were. So my third graders in 2016 were here. My third graders in 2017 are now fourth graders, they were here. And what happened? Between the two administrations of that SBAC math exam, 14% um, fewer of them met that threshold. Right? My fourth graders here, right? my fifth graders here, they're the same kids across two years, 33% fewer met the threshold, 9% fewer. And then there's something interesting that happens between 6th and 7th grade, what happens physically to the kids between 6th and 7th grade? Where do they go? They're off at the high school, middle school, high school. And then all of a sudden, you start to see a little bit of a turnaround, right? 15% more past it between this administration and this administration. A little bit of a loss here, but statistically insignificant. Um, typically a three-point change 
is statistically significant for these exams. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a little bit of a game here. So what I tried to do um, to put just some kind of rough number on these values that had some meaning that people could carry with you is here. If it's red, it means it's negative. It's, if it's black, it means it's positive. On average, in the elementary school, as you go from test to test, on average, mm -hmm. every year, 19% fewer students are meeting the proficiency threshold across the elementary years in math. Mm -hmm. On average, at the high school level, across the years that they're tested, right, they're getting a 6% increase. 6% right? increase from 7th to 8th, and then there's a couple of years in here, but then again, on the next administration of the test, there's another 6% increase here on average. Mm -hmm. So it's giving us some data to kind of take a look at um, about the health of the schools. Now, this chart over here is a little bit different. While this you're able to see the same students, at least across two years, what this is doing is this is just looking at the most recent year. So in 2016-17, the students that took the SBAC, this is where my third graders were, this is where those fourth graders were, right, fifth, sixth. Remember, these are all different classes of students. But you see the trend here. Right? Mm -hmm. As they're going up through the years, the trend is the same, whether you look at it here or whether you look at it here. For the most part, the overall trend is negative. So we've got some work to do academically. And again, I can't share with you the, the current data yet, but hopefully, maybe the next time we meet, I can throw that up there because the embargo will be off. Uh, let's see if the work that we did this year will be So before we start flipping through some of these charts, do all the basic pieces of these make a little bit of sense? Mm -hmm. Questions on what is here at this point in time? Just one. Um, I, for the 2016, the eighth graders, in 2017, they wouldn't still be the same cohort you're looking at, would they? They'd be in ninth grade then, not 11th. So, uh, so wouldn't those be two different cohorts, the 7 and the 10? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe I got, I'm going to go back and let me double check that one. So scratch that one. That's a good point. I'm not thinking about it. You get your, you get your head wrapped <laughs> into these so so so. Look at that number. I get it. Yeah. So it's a good point. So do we have enough kids for any of this to be statistically significant? statistical analysis so this is a math composite this is when we're looking at this in terms of third grade this is all the third graders in the, at the district so yes all the fourth graders in the district so it's across the, the three elementaries um, all the students um, in eighth grade all the students which is what how many kids we usually at right now on average class is probably 60 to 70 kids total so if you took all the third graders across the district and probably somewhere around that range or the 60 range. So it's a composite. It's all the third graders together across the three schools. I do have it broken out. Um, but that one was a little bit more difficult because of just the low numbers of some of the schools and some of the grades. Um, so I've, I've changed that data a little bit to take that into account. So questions on the math? Again, these numbers, um, how do they do they do they really mean what they do? Well, yeah, they kind of do. But you can see that the percentages change quite a bit from year to year. The important thing is the overall magnitude of the number, 19. 19 is bigger than a red red uh, 15, right? So you know that they're they're losing out a little bit more if you see 19 than if mm -hmm. you see a 15 or a 14. Of course. Okay? So the magnitude has meaning. Students with disabilities. So this is our one kind of important subgroup here, and it's our one subgroup that's growing. Our students with disability added close to half a million dollars to the budget this current year. That was one of the discussions that we had earlier on. And so well, what are we doing with that extra money that we're putting towards these students? If you take a look, uh, we have uh, three years of data for these guys, which is interesting. Uh, I think that they probably put the test out a little early to to do some um, preliminary research on it. But if you take a look, right, the pattern's the same. In this case, at least things were, were a little bit stable. Drop it. Now, the problem with the zeros, um, and I've been doing a little bit of look into those zeros, is 
if proficiency is here, right, you don't show up on this chart with a number unless you're above that proficiency threshold. Mm -hmm. The problem with the zeros is, yeah, there was some change that happened. Did they go from here to here if they were under the proficiency threshold, or did they go from here to here? When I took a look at those zeros, typically what happened is they dropped, unless, unless they were already very, very low. In that case, you saw a little bit of a gain. Um, but in most cases, if they, they were, you know, at a 10% of them were in, you know, level two, they would drop. If it was less than 10% in that level two, you know, they might stay the same. There might be a little bit of an increase. But again, not good. And the other piece, you know, if you compare the two charts, um, I actually threw the slopes up there because they have a little bit of meaning to me anyway. Um, the slope on this one is negative 5.2. That means, you know, when you're looking at the data in this way, um, between each successive taking of the exam, 5.2% uh, fewer are actually hitting proficiency. Um, problem is, and this is one of the things that No Child Left Behind was all about, um, is that if you look at our subgroup here, our students with disability subgroup, it's negative 7.4. So yeah, they're, they're both decreasing, which isn't good, but the subgroup is actually decreasing faster than the general population, um, which at this point in, in time, you know, had, had no child left behind not changed, had they not um, reinvented it as, as ESSA, um, we'd be in a lot of trouble right now. Um, uh, they could have actually come in and taken over the school, you know, if that had been going on for long enough. What are the cohort sizes for? Do you know what the cohort sizes were for the students with disabilities? Uh, students with disabilities, for the most part, um, I would guesstimate probably 20 to 30-ish. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So when they're given our percentage of students with disabilities in the district. So some of this wouldn't be a result of one or two kids leaving and causing it to drop significantly. So yes. It's, it's a um, large I'm going to talk a little bit about possible solutions and, and, and what I think the problems are. Now, I want to stop and take an aside for a second here. Um, this isn't because people aren't doing their work. You have a dedicated faculty dedicated staff that are coming in and they're working their tails off every day with these kids. Um, they're working their tails off in an environment where the trauma-based behaviors have taken hold, which is probably a good part of the impact here. Um, it's more, because we're looking at a standardized test, it's more about the alignment. Um, that's the first piece. Is it aligned? Are we actually teaching them what we're expected to be teaching them? Um, you know, we're teaching them something and we're teaching them some good things because I've seen some darn good skills, uh, especially with the seniors. Um, but the, the question then becomes, is it aligned with what we're supposed to be? So that's the first thing. And then the second question then becomes is, okay, if we're teaching what we're supposed to be, if we're teaching it and the kids aren't getting it, what do we have to do differently to make sure that they do? And so that's kind of what the state is going to be used to, to do an examination. Are, are the students with disabilities included in the original, in like the whole core? So then that slope would actually be shallower. If you took them out, took them, the yeah. general population would actually be shallower. So the overall impact means that usually what, you, usually what happens in a, in a district, you got your subgroup students, in this case the students with disabilities, you got your general population. You put initiatives in place to make things improve. Typically they both go up. And of course under the old little ch child up behind laws, that's not good enough because you're not closing the gap, right? You want this one to be doing that. Well, what we've got going on here is yep. that. Yeah. They're both going down, and the, the students with disabilities are losing ground pretty fast. But how do we know how much the, the non-disability population, if you could isolate that like you did the disability students, that would really give us a fair yep. picture of what's going on in the ordinary classroom. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's something I'm going to attempt to do um, the next time. Breaking out, one of the problems, you're hitting on one of the problems with the, the SBAC and the way the testing is reported. Um, it's not a bad exam for testing overall value added, right? Whether or not they're learning math or whether or not you know, they've got the right ELA skills. Where it's a crappy test is that it's the way they present it, it's hard to break the data out. It's hard to pull out the students with disabilities from the general population of the low-income students. You can do it, they're there, but you kind of have to pull the data from the individual students and then compile it yourself. So that's difficult. The second, well, we're, we're a small district. It's not impossible. Right. If, you know, if we're talking 400 kids per, per class, there's no, no way. 
Um, but the other problem with the SBAC, um, and there's some workarounds that we'll talk about, is that if the kids are scoring low in math, is it because they're scoring low in every concept in math? No. They're probably scoring, scoring low in two or three important concepts in their math class over the course of the year. The trick is figuring out which of those areas those are. And the SBAC doesn't give you resolution. It doesn't give you details to be able to weed out, OK, yeah, these, these 60 standards they were supposed to learn, it's these five. Mm -hmm. So that's part of where we're going to have to create some of our own kind of homegrown assessments um, to figure that out. The one nice thing that SBAC has done is they've added what are called these interim assessments um, that you can give. You know, you teach these couple of standards, you give this interim assessment, you see how the kids are doing. But that data is very useful because that points directly at a standard, um, whereas the overall general score is going. So you can tell there's something wrong a little bit in terms of the health of our, our students um, in math. But with the SBAC as it stands, it's very hard to point in and say, OK, the problem of everything that they're learning is here. This is where we got to work. So that's what we're going to be working on next year is figuring out how to get that resolution for out those details. So questions on the math. And Paul, awesome pick up on that 11th. I get my head so wrapped into the fine detail sometimes I miss the forest with the trees, right? Um, ELA composite, typically, to be honest, um, what you see is that ELA across the nation is typically a little bit higher. Um, a lot of that has to do with elementary preparation. Elementary teachers are generalists. Um, they tend to be much more comfortable with uh, ELA and social studies than they are with science and math. Um, not that they don't have a background in it, but in terms of the pedagogy and the teaching of it, uh, they tend to be just more comfortable with the ELA and social studies, so they tend to teach it more. Um, they spend a, uh, tend to spend a little bit more time on it. But uh, a fairly similar pattern, but not, not quite as pronounced, right? As you're going through the scores, right? A little bit of a drop here, a little bit bigger drop here. Oop. Bit of a drop here, right? A little bit of a gain here. So something interesting. Oh, uh, you know, I know we just crossed the threshold into high school again. Right, oop, bit of a gain here, bit of a gain here. Now, one of the reasons that the high school is performing a little bit better than the elementary schools, even though the elementary schools are providing the foundation, is because of what? And, and Elijah actually talked about it. He talked about what the five or six or seven different support systems they have mm -hmm. in for students, and they can do that because of their size. They got all those support systems. And not only do they have all those support systems that are in place, they need to be revamped a little bit to deliver the services a little bit more effectively. Um, but they've also got some services in place um, that started this year, that will continue next year, that's going to help the students with uh, the um, emotional component, um, which is going to be, be key to some of this. But you see, it's uh, the slope on, on this one when we're looking at you know, um, from grade to grade, again, the grades being different kids in that specific year. The slope's 0.5. It's pretty much flat. You know, they're not gaining anything, but they're not really losing anything either, which is good. Uh, but uh, and the scores are, are relatively, you know, reasonable. It'd be nice, you know, if I had an overall goal um, for the resources that we have, 70%. Um, 70% would be where I'd like to see every one of those numbers. Um, to get higher than that here, we'd have to change a few things, but I think 70% is certainly doable without changing too much. We'll talk a little bit about what that may be. Students with, with disabilities, uh, kind of same pattern again, right? You had, uh, you had 0.5, you actually had a little bit of a gain on the slope of the other line. This is negative, you know, 1.4. So again, students with disabilities, right, the gap's increasing. We're not closing that gap. We're not getting them so that they're meeting the same standards as the, the general population. Okay, now the big one. And again, before I throw this up here, um, populations are small. So how meaningful it is is anybody's question. So these are just those red numbers, right? I call it the average loss per year. So in terms of, of math, when you break it out for Randolph Elementary, you're looking at negative 18. You're looking at negative 9 uh, for e ELA. Um, Brookfield, negative 18, negative 21. And then Braintree is black in both cases. 
And so those folks are sitting down and talking a little bit about what's different. And there are different structures at Braintree than there are at the other two schools. And the most pronounced one um, is what they're doing to provide services for struggling learners. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we go on. Um, Brookfield, you know, it's, uh, we'll talk a little bit when we get to the financials. Um, I would argue it's mostly size. Um, we've got to get more students in there um, to be able to provide more, more staff and, and more resources, and we may have the opportunity to do that, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, some things came up in terms of enrollments. Enrollments have gone up there, and we need another teacher um, in the first and second grade. Um, Braintree is at a nice nice size. It's mid-80s, 80s-ish, so it's got small classes for the most part, but it's got good resources and it's got a very good structure for special education. Um, Randolph Elementary, um, its issue isn't primarily academic. They have a tremendous number of services and supports in place for students academically. Its issues are coming primarily from the emotional disabilities um, and the surge that it's seeing year after year. They seem to be the ones that are getting hit the hardest. Um, so questions. Again, those aren't meant to be taken as hard and fast numbers, but they're meant to be giving you an idea of the magnitude. Uh, negative 18 is bigger than negative, negative 12. So three things that work, and some of this uh, has started to be provided this time, and I want you to grill me and ask me questions about it. Um, 15 years in administration, um, trying various initiatives across different schools, um, probably to the tune of 12 or 15 of them. There are only three um, that I have seen that have actually provided reliable increases in academic performance um, across all of those schools. Um, first one, providing appropriate time, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about what that means. It's making sure that you're right timing the schedule. The students are getting enough, enough time on learning um, to be productive, but not so much. Uh, there is a, a diminishing return point, not so much that they're getting bored and pulling their hair out because they're sitting in a class for you know two hours at, at a pot. The other one is making sure in terms of time that the faculty have what they need to get together to communicate with each other, to take a look at the testing data that you have. Um, some of the tools we're going to need to develop so that they have that data and then to effectively plan what they're going to do differently um, you know, when they teach their classes uh, the next time around to the kids if, if what they're currently doing isn't, isn't getting them to make the grade. Um, a lot of that, that PLC work, um, you know, getting the, the, the staff together, a lot of those discussions that they have really is about this. It's about improving teacher expertise and curricular design. Um, teachers, especially at the elementary levels, they're users of curriculum. You know, elementary teachers are generalists, so they typically they buy a curriculum, they buy a program that they use because you can't plan for six separate disciplines each day. Um, so they're users of curriculum, but what they lose is they lose this developmental mindset um, that plays into how you deliver what you're teaching. And when you lose that mindset, sometimes it's really hard to tie things in directly to what the kids need. A little bit easier on the the, um, the high school teachers because a lot of a lot of the high school teachers develop their own curriculum. They're, they're content specialists in one area, um, and then restructuring the support for struggling learners, which is some of the discussions we've been having having at the uh, cabinet meeting. Right. Effective, so right timing. Um, it's time on learning for the students. It's typically controlled by a master schedule. Um, when we did our research about 10 years ago, we looked at the top performing schools in the nation, and 141 is the magic number at the secondary level. In other words, if you want your students to perform optimally in mathematics class, they need 141 hours of instruction in mathematics over the course of a year. At the elementary level, the magic number is 176. So 176 hours in your core content in mathematics um, and ELA um, each year uh, to be able to make sure that they're hitting the grade. So this is about four hours a week in a class. This is about five hours a week in this class. Well, it sounds like a lot, but it's really not a lot of time, an hour a day. Okay. Um, and I give, uh, Eric, I give the, the team a lot of credit. They're, they're shooting for changing um, the delivery of the math at the elementary level, they put it in at 70 minutes next year. And seeing what, what the impact is. Um, PLC time, right? Those teachers have to have time to, to get together and actually discuss 
what they're seeing in terms of the students and how the students are responding to the curriculum that they're, they're, they're delivering. Um, if they don't get a time, chance to sit down, take a look at their testing results, or just what they see in the classroom, there's so much that can come out from the teachers in terms of informal observation and share their expertise with each other about what they can do better, um, you're going to fail. Um, that's what's going to happen. And I don't think they've had that time. High school a little bit more than, than the, the elementaries. Um, but that was one of the reasons for building in the half days. And then the other thing in the building of the master schedule at the high school is seeing if we can build in common planning time so that they also have time during the actual school day to connect with each other at the department level and get some work done. Right. Just a quick try, probably about 10 more minutes and then let, let you move on, but I think it's important. Time on learning impact. So this is uh, Swamp Scott. All right. So A and play, advanced and proficient. So this is kind of like the charts that you just saw. Um, in other words, what it's looking at is the, the students that are above the proficiency threshold. And what we did at this school was this was just changing time on learning. This was just changing the master schedule. There were no other initiatives that were involved in this. So any changes in this data has to do with, with changing the master schedule. So I'm Scott had too much. They had 94 minute blocks. Okay? So they were, ended up having too much. At secondary level, you're looking at around the 60 minute time range for the classes. So what you'll see is, you know, they kind of went up and down. Um, but on average, you know, they were getting about 87% of the kids uh, were hitting the proficiency threshold on average. When we put the schedule change in, and you can see it was consistent, they're up around 97%. So one year after they right time their schedule, you had almost a 10% gain right, in student scores, just because the teachers had an effective amount of time to work with the kids on. Again, minimal impact. What do you do when you're changing the schedule? Okay, that's easy enough to do. Is that the same cohort group from one year to the other? Or? So this is um, this is looking at the students that took the exam that year. So they're not the same students. Mm. All right, but you can see you kind of have it coming up and around. And I do have the average from those years. It's around 87. And then immediately after the two years following, the things went into place, it's, it's 97, 98-ish. Again, just. Um, I'm just a little skeptical of statistics like this, that, you know, okay, so this is what it means. It had to be that one thing when you're dealing with different mm -hmm. homework groups. Because yeah. our experience in this district is, and the reason why <laughs> we decided to develop longitudinal data is because we have such small cohort groups that there was a significant cohort effect on occasion. Yeah, you get some kids that come in that just have tremendous skills, parents that were doing all the right things. Um, yeah. But or, or part, vice versa. Or, the or vice versa. Part of what you're going to see, though, is that I could throw the science and the social studies and everything else up here, too. The pattern's the same across all classes, which adds validity to the, the data supporting what it's supposed to store. So that was the LA. This is math, right? These guys hovering in here, you know, 82, 83 for the most part. Um, they had a teacher change this first year, um, it's, but it still went up a little bit. And then second year, again, this was just due to the schedule change. You know, they're up here touching close to 95% for the first time in their life, just the schedule change. The PLC time at Marblehead, um, this one was a little bit more interesting. So we did not change their schedule. All we did was we gave them time. Um, it was structured time. They had some things that they worked through. It was facilitated. Um, but we made sure that they had the common planning time. They had their 50 minutes three times a week. Um, we gave them their three full PD days a year, similar to what we have here, and they got their nine half days. So where did you find all this extra time? Like, we created it. Um, so were so, the kids staying in, the school, in school longer, or were we taking it away from something else? Or? So what we did with uh, these guys, and this was kind of interesting, um, because this is just managing when the teachers have their free periods, making sure that if you're in the science department, all, your, all of you have the same free period free. You know, period one, every, everybody mm -hmm. in science is, is free, period two. And the master schedule uh, builder can jiggle stuff around to make that happen in most cases. Um, the three full PD, PD days per year, they had two. We added a third, and then we added the nine half days. Where this came from is they had five minutes of passing time between classes. Uh, we whittled it down to four. And if you add up the number of minutes that that's, it adds up. 
it adds up to the additional time for professional development um, that we had. Yeah, that woke me up. So there are creative ways of finding it. Um, in our case, we already had the time available under state law, but this is part of the jiggling around. This thing did work this, well. This, we had trouble. Yeah, we already played this game yeah. a few times. Not Under state really law, successful. right, uh, we <laughs> contract for 179 days with the, uh, the teachers, but we only have to supply 175 days of instruction. Um, you know, so it's, it's jiggling a little bit of the time that way. But anyway, we go through it really quick so I don't bore you too, too much longer. Now, in their case, uh, Marblehead, they were already super performers, right? They were already on average. They were hovering right around here before the change went into effect. They started talking about it this year. This is the year that they were actually doing the change. Not much of an increase, but they were already scoring around 96% or higher for their proficiency rates most of the time. So we put the, the PLC time into place. It's getting them up to 98%, which they've been at consistently. But the biggest thing was right here. Right? So you don't see much here because they didn't have a hell of a lot of growth to be able to, to provide. The closer you get to 100%, the harder it is to squeak eek out another percent. But in that one year, the year following, um, you know, putting this, this into place, you had a 15% jump in the percentage of students that were scoring at the highest level on the exam. Okay. Well, from here to here. here right. Everybody was already over, over the bar, but then what it did was it took 15% of the kids and booted them up into the next category. Um, similar profile with math. Change took place here. Oh, all of a sudden, they had a pretty pretty good increase for them considering they're already scoring pretty high, but again, 9% of the students are now hitting the advanced year after year. And I've been able to follow them and, and talk with them. I still get emails from the school board each time the tests, the tests come out. But again, facilitate, facilitated uh, professional learning community time. We developed this simple little tool that they used. They'd sit down at the beginning of the year, they'd go through the local and the state assessment data, they'd identify which standards the kids were performing poorly on. That's the piece the SBAC is missing. Right? We've got to be able to get into what, con what specific concepts in a the class they're not, they're not getting. Aren't they already doing this with the data wall things? Yes and no. Um, the, data wall, the data wall only touches on which subject? Or did they ever tell you? Oh, yeah. It's no. only ELA. Right. Um, and the data wall does incorporate a little bit of this idea, but it's, it's not drilling down to the, the, the level of this is what the student needs in terms of the content. It's more looking at emotional, behavioral issues and whether or not that's improving or allowing the student to access the curriculum. What they did build in this year, which is gonna help them get to this data, mm -hmm. is they've got those common formative assessments. So now they're giving them an exam after they've taught something, seeing how the kids did, and then they can analyze that content that they just taught to see if the kids got it or not, and if they need to go back and adjust something. So that just started going into place as part of the work that we were doing this year. So hopefully, you know, hopefully we see at least a little bit of improvement when the stuff comes out, right? They identified the cause for the student performance, right? It's usually because either either they uh, it, they just didn't teach it, which is an easy fix, or they taught it, the students didn't get it, and then that's where the PLC took over, is they had a facilitated discussion about, okay, what are the classroom level changes going to be when we teach these concepts this year? Um, they would actually write that out as a lesson plan at the beginning of the year so that when those concepts came up, the lessons were right there. They had agreed to it as a department. They'd pull it up, they'd use it, and then they'd have a formative assessment that they created uh, with it at the same time to test it to see if it worked. If it didn't, they'd go back to the PLC. They'd figure, they'd talk about it again, try something new until the students got it before they'd move on. Um, so just some interesting stuff. Last piece here is restructuring the supports for struggling learners. And what's interesting is this is in line with... Um, with what the state is recommending after their DMG report. Um, so implementing a co-teaching slash learning center model. Um, learning center is the tier two intervention. So there's tier one, tier two, tier three. Tier one is best practice in the classrooms. All the teachers should be doing it. Tier two is small group instruction. It's a teacher with uh, you know five or six kids. Um, tier three is one-on-one. -on -one. You know, you're so severe that even that small group can be a little distracting. We need to have you one-on-one. -on -one. So what the Learning Center did was it provided uh, a couple of things, um, and we kind of changed around what, what they typically do. The student would go to the Learning Center, it was, a, it was an additional class worked into their, their schedule, 
And the teachers had a curriculum that they actually taught, and the curriculum was the actual accommodations the students are supposed to be learning to be able to access the curriculum. The IEPs weren't written there as, okay, you know, the English teacher, you will use the sequential graphics organizer when this student writes a paper. Instead, it was written, okay, student, the student will use the graphic sequential order um, organizer when you do a paper. And so the teacher would teach the students how to use those strategies. The co-teacher that was in the classroom was there for guided practice, okay? And in the class, you're learning how to use it. When you go to your regular education class, what ends up happening is you practice using those skills and you've got somebody there to nudge it if you're not doing it quite right to make sure that you get it. And then once you get it and you're independent, they step away. When the student comes back to the learning center, that teacher will take a look at the work they did. Okay, you did a paper in English. These were your three choices for graphic organizers. Which one did you choose to use and why? Yep, you used it. You did what you were supposed to. It looked like you used it well. Here's the grade and here's the credit that you get. Okay. Now this one was my baby. I love this one. All right. So this school um, actually did two things at once. Changed the master schedule, and it put in the, uh, the restructured uh, plan for struggling students. So yeah, they were kind of going up a little bit, ups and downs, ups and downs, nice little wave. So this is where the change in schedule went in. Right? So you see you're going from what, for about 47% to 60% in one year. And oh my god, the year after they put in the restructuring, how we delivered our special education services, 10, 20, 30, almost 40 point jump governor's commendation for that work. Similar in mathematics, right? Had a tough year here because they had a, they had a struggling teacher, but here's the year that the, for SPED, here's the year that the structural change um, happened with the master schedule, here's the year that the restructuring for the uh, struggling learners went in. Right? So up over 90%. So again, kind of the goal that they've been working towards over the course of the year, whether they realize it or not, is they are trying to write time their master schedules. That's already happening um, at the elementary schools. Like I said, I give Erica a lot of credit when they were planning it out. They're shooting for 70, 70 uh, minutes for math. Math is the place we're struggling the most, so that's going to be the primary focus this first year round. Um, making sure that the PLC time is there, that's already there. We built it in this year. Um, unfortunately, not all the schools have the full structure to be able to use it effectively. Elementary schools have fully developed curriculums that they can use to analyze and, and, and the testing now from the common formative assessments to be able to do this work. The high school, in some cases, they do, in some cases, they don't. So the first work that they need to be doing in this time is making sure those curriculums are up to speed. Okay. Part of this leads to this, right? The two go hand in hand. And then restructuring the service delivery to struggling learners is something that we've been talking about um, all year. The problem that we've got is a lot of our struggling learners, it isn't so much about the academics. Right? There's not things that are, there's not organic things that are getting in their way of learning. Um, it's the emotional behavioral piece that is. And so the big thing that we're going to be working on, and you'll hear me talk about more and more, is getting a therapeutic um, school within a school here at the elementary school at Randolph Elementary. Um, we're trying to get the space cleared up. It's a two-year plan. Um, next year is envisioning it. We've got the right right person coming in. Um, and then in year two is getting that therapeutic um, school here. Because what's going on right now and why the costs are so much with special education is, is they're managing the problem, not fixing it. Um, they keep pulling in another para. Oh, we got a student with severe behavioral problems who can't manage themselves in the classroom, we need to set somebody with them so that they're not violent. Um, so yeah, the behavioral interventionist, that para that comes in, can do that job. But the problem is, is that when that para walks away at the end of the day, that student has no more skill in controlling themselves than they did at the start of the day. And mm -hmm. that's a problem. So the purpose of the therapeutic program is to start to give those students those skills so that they can solve regularly. So we've got a lot of work to do. There's, there's a lot of good here. There's a lot of very invested people. There's a, the teachers are doing an incredible amount of work. Um, but there's some al alignment. And I think the, the two or three things that are going to have the biggest impact, what's nice about them is they're simple. They're small. Um, high school is, is, is um, in a difficult position right now 
because they're also under the mandate of having to do the graduation, right? Graduation proficiency, standard-based report cards. That's getting in the way of doing the curriculum work that needs to be done. Um, can't do it all at once. Um, that one's the law. That one's the mandate for 2020. You know, so I'm pushing on Elijah to hopefully get that done over the course of the next year so we can really focus on, on, the, on the, the ground floor of the curriculum piece. So questions on all this stuff I just threw at you. Part of the problems with uh, the ends, social studies, um, some of the foundational ones is we do not have good tools to measure them in academic terms. It's going to take a little bit of time because we're going to have to develop our own homegrown tools. There's nothing wrong with that. There's not a standardized test out there that's going to measure it for you, which in some cases there are if, they, if we decide as a cabinet we want to use them. Like uh, foreign language is great because you've got the national, national Spanish exam, you've got the national French exam that you can use as, as, a, as an end tool. Um, but in some cases, with, when that doesn't exist, we have to create our own, and that's going to be some of the work that's happening next year. So as we go through these, I'll talk about you know, how we're kind of reinterpreting these and the tools that we plan on using to, to measure them over time to see if we're meeting the ends. Great, thank you. All right. Um, here we are at the review draft of the annual agenda report. Um, which has this tiny print in the packet. Um, one thing we did talk about was moving some of these um, some of these reports from um, Elijah and Lane into a better time frame, so that we would move those perhaps into the fall when we could use um, just this most recent data. That seems to make sense to me. Um, otherwise, everything else has been. Right, Linda, just sort of put back where it generally has been. We, we did talk about moving the auditor's um, report until earlier. Yeah, um, except for you're going to run into tax time. That's always an issue for them. Come yeah. On. I mean, last year she said she was done in January or February. I know, right? but then they, we, they then it's not just us. Yeah. It's all over. Maybe. Okay. So Robin might, might have, have an idea where, on that. Yeah. When would you well, we tried to move it up this year. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's, yeah, Angela always did that for me. Okay. All righty, and next the uh, annual, what do you say, so review draft of annual agenda report? Is it not in the it's packet? Not in the I packet. have one. I didn't put last year's in. I don't have a new one. Okay. That's what I assumed that you could have. I couldn't find it either. I was just no, sitting here thinking I've here. overlooked it, but okay. I, I don't know. I didn't put last year's in. You guys got no, last year's at the beginning of the year. Right. Yeah. So that, year. that's the last, that's the year this at a glance. Last. It's not oh, the okay. next, and not a new one. It's oh, right. Uh, uh, right. It's right. Yeah, yeah. 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 from here it seems perfect. Should we run copies for everyone then, now, or? Well, you guys all got last year's last year. Right. We, I mean, you can okay. run copies, sure. Okay. But Is I mean, I don't know if it's going to help you if you're going to switch things around a bit. Okay, so we really should put this it needs to into be another. That's yep. what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, yeah, I know. I can't. <laughs> Here. That wasn't we'll anything I ever did. I yeah. took Angela. I don't know. We'll make an opinion on what, yeah. and when we should do things. So I'm just going to go with That's what okay. you say. <laughs> You're still in the first All right, three Paul was going to <laughs> talk about a little bit about the annual re review of ENDS policy. Do we want to put this to the next <clears> time? I mean, we can do it now, but um, so we're already going. Yeah. yeah, we've got plenty to do, and we probably should print out the yep. board goals again for everyone so that we can review them. Okay. So let's table that for now as well. All right, EL monitoring. We've got the facilities plans update. Lane, that's you again. Yeah, so that's this paper here. So what we did is we, to try to get it a little bit more um, in common with uh, what, what Mark was doing um, is we've got the overview of, of what's different between last month and this month on top. And then inside we're beginning to uh, be able to kind of flesh things out a little bit more in terms of the work that's happening, how it's prioritized, what the estimates are and what the cost is, uh, whether the work is, you know, in progress completed, is it out to bid at this point in time. Um, so if there's any, any questions or parts and pieces on this, um, you know, we can talk about 
Um, the hope is, is that we'll keep this um, updated over the course of a year, fiscal year. And then when a new fiscal year comes up, we'll move the stuff over that has not been completed or in progress to that and then just continue to add to it. So that at the end of each fiscal year, you've got this running report of what have we been working on, what's done, what's, what's, what's still happening. Okay. Um, like we used to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that's nice. Yeah, so we get, kind of try to get back. So we're still we're still get we're still getting there, but it's it's getting closer. Um, we did look. There was some additional reporting that Mark had had, um, and I have copies of that if folks want to see it. The additional reporting was kind of reporting out how he was spending the reserve funds that the board had granted to him. We have not received any reserve funds or spent any reserve funds, so those parts are not part of this report this year. Um, I'm sorry. I the beginning of oh. what you were saying. So, so there was, uh, Mark had some other paperwork with his reports that he um, submitted, um, but most of the, the paperwork, it was about um, the monies that he would receive from the reserve fund that the board had approved and just how he was spending it. And so the reason that you don't have copies of those forms from us is because this year we haven't touched the reserves at all. There's no oh, spending right. from it. So that's the one piece that's missing if it looks different than what he presented. In, in terms of Raven at this point, you're working on RFPs for that stuff? So Raven, um, as we're going through the learning process, um, the, the, that piece should be in there a little bit. Um, the permitting process um, to get the work done is tremendous. Um, even the bid, it doesn't, have to go, it doesn't go out for a standard bid. It has to go out for a 90-day bid. Um, so what we've done is we talked with uh, a couple of the other districts and they recommended a, um, a group that works with schools um, that does the project managing piece. So in other words, they go out, they do the permitting and everything for you. Um, cost is they are estimating between 10 and, and uh, 14,000. Um, and so we're working with them to get that up and running. So Raven is going to be a good probably year long process. Um, in the interim, I've talked with uh, Mark and, and Wes and Robin about making sure that if we have to use that building again, um, that we follow through on the engineer's recommendations. We do have some money left over at the end of the year. The big recommendation was uh, air filtration systems. Um, there were a couple of air purifiers that they recommended that we can put in. And then the other alternative that I've already spoken with Jim about, we've got to figure out which is the most conducive, is potentially, you know, having them either in a space at uh, the tech center or at the high school. Um, one of the reasons, Jim is, is amendable to that, but one of the reasons not to do that is just because it, it can destroy the therapeutic environment for the students. Um, you know, if things are, are very busy, if there's lots of noise, if there's, it can just, it can be very distracting um, to the work that they're trying to do. And you're, you have about 14 students? Uh, 14, I asked him what the maximum was that he said. Uh, it's, it's been up to 18 at times, but he doesn't like to push it that hard unless he has to. We did talk about the possibility that, um, especially given the need, um, that you know, with a new building um, structured the the way that it looks like it's going to be structured about expanding that program, and that is a possibility. Um, the gentleman that works with him um, uh, is on there part time, is probably be getting pretty close to retirement, um, and that would give us an, an opportunity if that happens to kind of restructure at least the staffing piece to be able to bring in more kids. So Jim is open to that. So if we are building a building, do we have to take down, when would we have to take down the current Raven building? So that becomes the, the big uh, crux. Um, early on, we had kind of talked about the building itself. You know, if we built on a separate site, you know, on our own grounds, we'd still have this building that we, with the problems that we had to deal with. Um, so the bidding that's going out is for removal. Um, you know, depending upon how long this process takes, it's possible that if we get the process done in, in the, the, the five to six months it takes, all the permitting and the, the, the going out to bid, that at that point in time it might be easier just to say, okay, you know, start the construction next June. Um, and that way it's done all at once over the summer. Um, building it in that span of time doesn't seem to be the issue. Um, it's just you got to get all the steps out of the way. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I take part of the blame um, for that as I figured it was a shorter process to get it out to bid than it was. But when we started to really take, take a look and when, when people seemed agreeable to, to moving forward with it, um, it's a much more involved um, 
Yeah, Vermont's got a lot of little quirky laws. <laughs> that's, yes, sure does. Uh, so I'm a little astonished by the numbers that I'm looking at. Maybe I just haven't focused on this lately. Yeah. Um, but we're talking about over seven hundred thousand dollars now. Right? Yeah. And I, I mean, correct me if I was wrong, but when you originally came to us, where you had suggested that we needed, you know, a new roof and to remove some uh, wet insulation and there might be some issue of some asbestos. No asbestos. No asbestos, okay. But there was wet insulation and then there was air problems. There, um, mold problems, the structure in the ceiling, the spacing was off. It was too wide for the snowstorms that we get. The foundation was cracking. There was a whole 60-page engineering list on it. So that original, it was going to be 300000 just to fix the crisis stuff, not really to get the building up to speed. Um, so 300000 just to fix the stuff that was like immediate. Um, and, and so my question at that point was, mm -hmm. my gosh, that's a huge amount of money just to put a couple Band-Aids on a building. How yeah. much is this property assessed for? What is it worth? What would it be worth if we dumped 300 grand into it? And so that's, um, I think, you know, then you looked at other options and, and then Robin uh, suggested maybe the building like behind OSSD because it goes up very easily. It's like... Easy to build, perfectly Very suited. Very expensive. Yeah. Now, I know the costs have gone up, but I was kind of of the, of the impression we'd be <clears> spending somewhere around the same amount of money on the Band-Aid approach versus like just putting up a new building, and now it's like more than twice at this point so what six, I thought we were talking about. So six six ninety four is what we've talked about at the board the last two times uh, the information has been out there. Um, we also did the cost analysis um, in terms of Raven. Raven's a little difficult to to tell what it's you know what it's costing because it's money we don't have to pay because the students are here for the most part right it's money that we're not paying out. Um, I did an analysis that I gave to the board a few months back, um, looking at on average how many of the OSSD students we serve, given their type of disability that they had, how much it would yeah, cost yeah. to send them out. So even at, even at the 700000 that building would be paid for, pay for itself within six to seven years. Um, and that was just on the, the cost of tuitioning those students out. That didn't include the probably forty to 50000 a year in transportation costs in addition to it. Um, so if taking all that into account, you're, you know, you're probably talking a four to five year time frame for it to pay for itself. But again, it's money that we don't spend. Okay, but, but <clears throat> My father-in-law had a had an expression. He used to say, "I don't trust any statistics that I don't manipulate myself," <laughs> which was sort of what I was. So, so, but here's the thing. Okay, I, I get you're comparing it to because we save money creating Raven, taking tuition, and having a lower cost for our own students. So, I, I get the idea. It pays for itself. My husband says that all the time about a ski pass because by the t <laughs> sixth time that he goes, the it's ski pass it. has paid for itself. Yeah, and I, I get that, and I and I understand it. But my question still remains: We're putting seven hundred thousand dollars into a piece of property now. Our investment in that piece of property is what versus what the value of that piece of property is, because I think there's a huge difference between it'll pay for itself versus you know, so we're making seven hundred thousand dollars profit in <clears throat> five to six years. That's two different things because we're not making that m amount of profit from this program. You're just saying we're saving and what you know, it's paying for itself. I'm just trying to figure out what the point of the discussion is right now. So I'm trying to understand: Have we ever figured out what the property is worth? What what it will be worth when we sink seven hundred grand into it? Is it a property that? Um, yeah, I'm trying to figure out in terms of the assets of the district, if we're spending money, what is now our capital investment going to actually be worth? That's that's just yeah, the piece just, that it, I've been trying to. It would be out. the it would be the value value of the building that, that sits on the property. Um, separating it out because it is the property that the high school and the tech center sits on. I mean, it's on the same land. It might be a little bit difficult. But I'm happy to have a real estate agent come out and take a look give an idea um, but or even the bank but I don't think they'd be able to give a credible estimate until the thing was actually built and they could look at it 
but I'm happy to talk with a real estate person. But again, I think the, the issue is, is that value, I mean, we're not a financial organization. We're an org organization that educates kids. And so the value in terms of an asset that this is, is the educational value it provides to the kids that it serves. And those kids have been living in a substandard building for over 16 years. And they are not being served well because of that. So a lot of this work is about equity, making sure that they are getting the same services and having the same access to our curriculum that everybody else in the district gets. And that's my primary concern. But I, I'm happy to talk with. Uh, well, as is our mission statement, but our mission statement also has within you know, the reasonable allocation of resources. So it's our job as a board. And I thought that we were still comparing options. Um, but I still had never gotten an answer to that piece of information because I totally agree with you. And if this <clears throat> building, I don't know, um, you know why it has been substandard for some time period. It certainly does need to be improved um, so that our children can be educated properly. However, we need to also ask those important questions because that doesn't mean you just throw money at a problem to try to say now everyone is equal because we threw a lot of money at it. I want to make sure that what we're doing is accomplishing the goal that you're yeah. talking about in the most reasonable economic, yeah. um, you know. And what I, and what I was asked to do was compare it to other equitable properties that were out there and we did that, but I'm happy to move forward on this, this, this new um, question. So are you suggesting that we rethink the design of this new building? Or, I mean, we already, because we think, did look look at other properties to see whether, and, right. and they were, it, we found that it was going to be more reasonable to, to you know, raise the, the, orig the current building and, be, and build there. So, you know, are you asking whether we should, you know, consider a different design, or what do you? No, I think I was just looking for um, more solid financial information about, okay, we're going to spend 700 this is what we'll end up with for our seven hundred thousand dollars. So maybe it will be something worth three hundred. I don't know, um, but I thought that was an important piece of information to have mm -hmm. um, before going forward with um, you know. Okay, now it's you know another fifteen grand for permitting and all these other things. Um, now, if if that's the course um, that's identified, that's wonderful. But seven hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money. And while I know there's money in the ma building maintenance fund, it just, I thought it was important to get all of the financial information mm -hmm. and valuation. I think it's important to understand what we're buying for that amount of money. And so usually, usually the board would vote just to say, you know, to put me to the task of collecting this data, and I'm happy to do it. Well, that's not on the agenda, so we can't do that. Anyway, it's just a question, and if we could get that information. I'm not suggesting we spend money hiring appraisers, but if we um, have the ability Again, to generally the board would vote before putting me to a task. So do we want to wait and do so this in? I wouldn't worry about it then. Well, can you Never value a property without, I'm just thinking of like order of things. How can you assess the value added to the property until we know the type of building that's going to be there? And how do we know that unless we do an RFP to hear from the different companies what they can do for what dollar amount? You know, I. No, all I, I was, all I was getting at is, is if ultimately what you're you're throwing seven hundred or. Who knows what the cost over it's it'll be eight or nine or a million. Right, it's an estimate. All, all I was looking for is, are we gonna end up with something that's worth like half of what the money that we're spending on it is? Mm -hmm. And maybe fixing up what was there, which was the original idea, would be a better idea. I don't know. I mean, I thought that the superintendent was in the request for proposal stages to figure out, okay, we have, we've identified there aren't any other turnkey operations around that we can just slip into because there's a laundry list of requirements. But I think as, you know, the fiscal gatekeepers, we should put Lane's feet to the fire to make sure that we're not, 
if we could create the same thing by improving what is there, even if it has a cracked foundation, even if it has insulation that needs to be removed, maybe spending twice that much and ending up with something that is equivalent in quality and value, it just doesn't make sense to me to throw money away. That's all. But if the board is not inclined to put it on the agenda next time, then don't worry about it. So, you know, my only concern is we've had this discussion for six months. We're in the pipeline, and now we're getting thrown a curveball. Straight up. Yeah, I, I mean, I do think that numbers were there last month. Um, and we're not, you, no, no final project would be done. I mean, it would have to go out for the you know, the request for proposal and whatnot to get more solid numbers because that was just a general kind of wholesale um, to get us in the ballpark. I mean. So these RFPs, are, are we going to get several different uh, sort of options for size and space um, and things like that? Or they the are discussion is, is with Jim in trying to mimic um, what is there. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a set amount of classroom space as opposed to uh, space for the machine shop as opposed to the place that they need for their their kitchen and that sort of stuff um, so there is kind of a set layout and what have you yep. yeah yeah okay. so um, obviously we have requirements for how many kids and, and yep. all the other you know, required amenities um, for a school so um, and who, so where did this 694. So that was uh, Chase and Eagley who came in. Um, they are the ones that built the original um, warehouse building. Um, we, the OSSD building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the where they were going to do the centralized warehouse. Right. Um, the new barn. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they came in and, and gave us kind of a magnitude of scale estimate. That's the 694. Okay. Um, they, it was much lower than that, um, the original estimate we got. And then we said, well, wait a minute. Does this include removal of the old building? Because we don't want to have to deal with that as well. Uh, because, you know, if we build something new, then we have to also then have to pay to remove the other one, not just have them all do it in one shot, and see if they can save a little bit of money by repairing and reusing the foundation that's there. And so that's what they looked at when they did that, that proposal. Okay. So this is going to share the exact same footprint, more or less. Yeah, we're pretty close to. Yeah. So board, how do we want to proceed here? I believe that we were asked to release surplus funds. And we had a long discussion about how that couldn't happen. That was for the alarm system. That was for the alarm system. But anyway, you said it's $600,000. Estimates at the time placed the cost of remediating the basic issues mm -hmm. at the current Raven building of $300,000. Yeah. And so $300,000 to remediate. Uh, this is existing building, and then 684 is from Nico and Chase. Is that, is that what? Yeah, so that's removal of the building and then rebuilding in, in place. Um, and then the 300000 again, the reason that I wrote it as basic is because it's just to address the, the like I said, the mold, um, the all the stuff that just has to be happened to make it a functional building. Not, you know, upgrading it, not giving them anything in parity with what the other students have, but just the basic, you know, critical mass issue items. So I guess I go both ways because this is an estimate until we put it out for bid. bid. Yeah. So, I mean, we got an es a guesstimate from one company. Mm -hmm. It's hard to decide mm -hmm. what to assess until we know what the actual Cost would be. Or what they're mm -hmm. what they're proposing, or yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm, we're working with a guesstimate now. It mm -hmm. almost seems like we should have um, complete data on what renovating the building we have up to standard would be, 
so not the same standard as to the same standard as a new, okay. not patching it to the absolute bare minimum. I mean, making it well, yeah. acceptable, because it's not acceptable if it's not good enough for all of our students. So how much would it cost to do the same thing that you would want to do with the new construction for renovation? To the old? same standard. Yeah. Because I think that that would be the way to compare apples and apples. Yep. I can get that. I, the engineering report said it would be cheaper to replace. I remember yeah. that conversation. Yes. Yeah, so they didn't give it, but they did not give us numbers. Mm -hmm. They just right. said, it would, just, given, given what we got to do to just to do the remediation, it would be cheaper to. Because it's hard to compare numbers to numbers yep. when there are no True. numbers. Well, and our goal is to have a good facility. Right. We don't so much care how we get there so much is right. to do it with the best well. re use of our resources. We, we have a target for when we want this to be completed because last year. More time. <laughs> <laughs> like the more time we yeah, we don't want to talking about it the, the less useful it is for the students. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can probably um, you know if the board board desires I can probably try to get a, at least a magnitude bid on mm -hmm. um, you know full full renovation up to you know what we would expect in our other buildings versus right because because yeah. I think that, that makes sense because you mentioned it, it says the cost to remediate the remaining issues quickly pushes the total price tag to or beyond the cost to build new but it doesn't say the the number yeah because the three hundred thousand for the basic basics the basic. yep. band aid that's what that is mm -hmm. right yeah. unless you have numbers we just don't I just don't feel like we can. So I can get a rest, rest, I'll try to get a restoration number. That's Thank you. See, you can hit a curveball. Well. <laughs> yeah. Actually, what I'll try to do is, um, I'll see if I get uh, Neagli and Chase to come back out. They were, they were pretty quick to respond. Okay, next is the EL 2.7 report. That's Paul and Jen. Yes, and my apologies that I get it this morning. May and June are just crazy. Just coffees. Did you guys get one? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oops, did you get this one? guys want to say anything about what you found? So um, personally, this one is really cut and dry. It's one of the policies where either we're doing it and we have the evidence or we're not doing it and we have the evidence. Good. And um, so there was supporting documentation. And then there's also a, um, a sign off on from the business manager um, verifying that the different policy pieces were met. So in my opinion is yes. It's a reasonable interpretation and there's sufficient evidence. Okay. So do I have a motion to accept the um, EL2 report, E2.7 report? Can I make the motion if it's not? I think okay. so. I'll make the motion. Sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and a second? And a second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Um, legislative update, Lane? Uh, yeah, the two two big big things. I, I put my little rant in the the report there on the H uh, 897. Um, that was the changes to the special education law. Um, in terms of funding. Um, and so what they did is they're moving away from, it was signed into law um, on the 25th. Um, they're moving away from a reimbursement model where every student that we get, you know, about 55% is reimbursed. And then if it's above a certain amount, they give us even more um, kind of as a circuit breaker um, to a basically what amounts to a block grant where they look at the number of students that we have in the district as a whole, not special education students, but district as a whole. And they use that to determine a set chunk of money that you get for the year. Um, they do have a, a kind of what I call a circuit breaker provision 
information in there, um, which is if uh, you get a, an exceptional need student that has to go to out of placement, um, then once you hit $60,000, they'll do some reimbursement, but not at the rates that it was. So I did a, an analysis that was close to a situation that we had last year. If we have three students move into district, um, that need to be sent out, you know, with um, emotional disabilities that are that are such high needs, we can't handle them here. You know, those students typically run around $100,000 a piece. Um, under the old way, the reimbursement system, um, what we would get for those students amounted to uh, mid 70s in terms of reimbursement. We'd have to pay it up front, but we'd get the money back. Under the new system, it's about 35,000 we get back per student. And then the problem becomes is because the other money is comes in the form of a block grant, we can take the money from the block grant to pay that funds for it. But if we get too many students, the block grant runs out, and then how do we fund SPED right. for mm -hmm. the rest of the, the district? Now, what's interesting about the plan from an educational perspective is that if this were dealing with students with academic needs, it's a beautiful plan mm -hmm. because the schools do need to restructure how they're supplying those services for students under special education. Mm -hmm. But the problem is this isn't for academic needs. These high expense students have emotional disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and the types of plans, you know, putting in tier one interventions and tier twos are not gonna work for these kids. Mm -hmm. um, so you're not gonna see the efficiencies that they're, they're predicting are, are needed to make this all work. So I have, I have a great fear about that. Um, the plan is set to, to work into place over the course of five years. Um, so hopefully there'll be some changes um, between now you know, and the time it comes to full fruition. Um, in terms of the overall budget, I'm sure folks have been following the news. Um, the last piece of legislation that they put forward was H13. Um, it was intended just to keep things running until they could work out the more contentious issues around education funding. Um, that is expected to also get vetoed by the governor. Um, and um, he's already vetoed two proposals that came forward. So uh, your guess is as good as any um, uh, what will happen. I did uh, talk with local representative last week and was not positive. Uh, in other words, I asked, I said, is there a light at the end of the tunnel yet? You know, can you see, see things working out and no light at the end of the tunnel at this point in time um, when I spoke with them last week? So things are all still completely up in the air with no, no clear focus on how they're going to come to some sort of conclusion or resolution. Um, also, in terms of, uh, oh, actually, it's, that's a little different. Go ahead. That was the legislative piece. Can I ask a question about the H given I said you said five years? So, is there a plan? Like, it's not going to be implemented until five years, or is it uh, like kind of a slow one phase one, two, three to slowly transition it okay. over? Um, I got to read a little bit more into the details on, 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 on what it composes. But again, like I said, the, the big, big worry for me looking at it is if these were academic issues, beautiful. We're, we're already doing that work anyway on the academic side, but it's the behavioral piece. Um, I did talk um, both with the superintendent's uh, group and with um, local rep about um, two pieces of legislation um, to potentially put up one of them that may help with this. Um, the second one that I spoke of was the idea with the students um, in DCF, Department of Children and Families. If we have a student that comes in that has broken bones or has obvious bruises, we can call up DCF. Um, they take a look at the student. They're going to investigate it because they figure the student's going to be um, you know, at risk of immediate harm, and they may pull the student out of the home and get them into a safer environment. But we have students that come in every day that are aggressive, that bite, that kick, that close down classrooms um, because it's what it takes to get them back into control, whose behaviors clearly come from abuse. Mm -hmm. And trying to get something on the books that forces them to treat students that behave that way um, in the same manner they would as a student with a broken bone. Because if we get those early interventions, maybe we won't be seeing the number of students with a trauma-based um, behaviors uh, on the other end that, 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 that we've got. So hopefully see if that has some fruit because I, I, I feel they're looking at this problem backwards. You know, you're, you're looking at a, at a problem with behaviors with students in schools as a financial problem as opposed to an educational one. So, but that's my thoughts. All right, next is the consent agenda. We've got to approve the minutes from our last meeting, which is enclosed in the agenda packet. 
Um, we've got to approve an administrative contract for the associate principal. Um, all this stuff's in there. Staff contracts, new teachers, and arbitrage. Are there any questions or about any of those? Tell us who the administrative contract is with. Yeah, uh, they actually um, they decided on uh, Katie Sutton, um, who has been in district uh, for six years now as the the PBL coordinator. Um, it was interesting. We had a, a pretty good group for the the committee. Um, they started off with six kind of semifinalists um, that they interviewed, and after that first round of interviews, they whittled it down to three. They had to meet three or four times um, because the three were so close. Um, kind of different, different, a little bit different flavor each one, um, but they they ended up. Uh, pretty unanimously um, going with Katie. I mean, she'd been in the position, she'd been serving it, um, you know, in David's absence for a while. Um, and I think the big piece that, that stood out for her was she had the curriculum background, which a lot of them had, um, but she also had that the student background, especially working um, on students in terms of discipline issues, and then, you know, dealing with the, with the parents, um, with some of the, the tougher parents, and had done a very good job. Um, so that's who they're they're recommending, and I, I support that recommendation. <clears throat> yes, there's other questions. So, are we ready to approve the consent agenda? I have a motion. Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. So we have the superintendent's report, which we've pretty much um, covered just now. Um, are there any other things you want to add, William? Um, questions from anyone? We, we talked about the NCAA, a lot of it we've touched on. The only piece that we didn't was the, the, the drinking water um, okay. issues. So um, what's happening right now is we've got an engineer um, who is coming out. Um, they are pumping out the well. Um, they're dropping a camera down there because they feel that there are actually two aquifers. There's a higher level one and a lower level one, and mm. they're separated by a nice little capstone. Mm. And so the concern is, is that what's happening is the water from the upper aquifer, which is the contaminated water, is actually dripping down the well casing into the lower. Mm. So the visual inspection is gonna help them determine if that's really going on. If it is, then it may just be a matter of putting in a, a section of pipe about 150 feet long and packing it off with clay to seal it up. Um, just to keep that water from going down into the lower aquifer. So that's what they're trying to, to determine. They're, if, if that comes out positive on um, the investigation, they may just be able to reclaim the well. Um, if not, um, then we're going to have to look at, at drilling. Um, you know, minimal, minimum cost, if everything went perfect, is probably in the $30,000 range. Mm -hmm. um, and then depending upon how deep, deep the well is, can go up quickly from there. Um, it seems like bottled water would probably be cheaper. <laughs> and over the course over the course of time, it adds up. But yeah, you're right. Um, but it'd be it'd be nice to see if they can reclaim that because um, that that would be an easy fix. So hopefully that work is ongoing. Um, hopefully the next time we meet, we'll have an answer. So that is the goal. So August. So in July, we've got our retreat. So. We've got our retreat. Right. I don't Okay. Probably won't have a one meeting now. Right. Yeah. All right. Directors and principals reports were closed. Financial report. Do you have anything you should notice on that? Uh, our attention? I had thrown out the status of the, just because we hadn't been doing that. Um, where the reserve accounts are. I put that on a, a separate sheet. Um, had a couple of comments. We haven't spent anything out of those accounts this year, um, but we did check on something. Um, I felt that given the potential changes in the special education law, um, where we get stuck with a set amount of money for the entire mm -hmm. year and you don't know who's moving in or moving out, um, to check to see if it were possible if there's funds left at the end of the year to create a reserve account for special education, mm -hmm. um, and yes, it is. And I've included the um, uh, opinion of uh, Paul wow. Giuliani there. 
um, and his, that's included on the back. So if they're assuming there's money left over at the end of the year and we get to that, that March meeting about talking about the reserve accounts and, and voting on some money, um, I'll probably be asking the board to you know, set that aside for, for special education. Um, and again, wow. the, can I jump in and just say I would be vehemently opposed to that? Yep. Oh, sorry. Um, and I have discussed some of the reasons with you, but I think that operating expense, first of all, there's no history of this district ever being able, to, not being able to cover our expenses. Well, I understand there may be changes in the future uh, in terms of funding formulas and all of that. There are decisions made by all sorts of people about who gets put here through DCF, as a matter of fact. Terms. And if um, there are placements made where they think that school districts can absorb um, significant mm -hmm. costs. So if there's some big reserve fund, um, that may be perceived as um, an invitation to, um, that would put us in a position of having to accommodate more situations than um, we already shoulder, which on occasion can be very significant. The other thing is I think it compromises our ability to pass budgets and certainly to get voter approval <clears throat> for putting money into reserve uh, funds for building maintenance, etc. If we start creating other um, surplus money funds that people will, will perceive will be setting aside for someone other than you know the school as a whole. Um, so if this is something that you want to pursue to try to convince the board of, at least I would need to see some pretty convincing information um, from a pretty global perspective that this would be a good idea. Our auditors have continually for a number of years discussed with us um, their dislike of surplus funds and the fact that um, you know they prefer to see bonding for building uh, of facilities and that kind of thing. Um, so I would just so there are no curveballs later on this year. Um, I would expect to see some some pretty significant analysis of pros and cons of those issues before I would be uh, willing to be convinced that it would be a good idea to start creating even more of these surplus accounts. They were important for specific reasons and I think keeping them to the ones that we have um, is what our community wants and expects and just giving you my position on it. Appreciate. It. I'm happy. I'll also make sure that I'm talking widely with the community about it during the open forum, so I'll be able to provide the community's feedback as well. So, oh, good points. <clears throat> All right. Anything else on the financial report? <clears throat> All right. Board evaluation, Paul, that's you. Um, Do you have any special comments that we should be aware of? What time is it? 8.35. 8 8 All right, so we just focused on the ball. We ended on time. Board evaluation, yeah, we ended on time, but uh, we had to remove a section that probably would have lasted another 20 minutes or so. So, um, yeah, make sure we have that the, next. Uh, the agenda was well focused, all that stuff, but we just got to work on um, better allotting, allotting excuse me, time. Everybody was prepared. Everybody was uh, listening to other viewpoints and uh, treating each other with respect and courtesy. Work was accomplished in atmosphere, trust and openness. But all that's good. All right, thanks. Um, do we have an? Do we need an executive session? Okay. No, we potentially had a student issue. Yeah, uh, right. Issue, but uh, which route? Which were the request? The person did. Okay. 
Okay. So the next thing we have is a, um, a board training exercise that uh, Jen was yep. going to run. This is the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was thinking about how to do this, I actually okay. came up with some questions yeah. of like preference for the group. That's your brain. Because I can see like three different ways we could do this, mm -hmm. where we could just like all together work like a board discussion to kind mm -hmm. of answer the questions. I found um, lots of rehearsals, with some practices, and the answers, which is very helpful. <laughs> just saying. Um, so we could do it like just having a conversation for 20 minutes at the board meeting, which. I'm willing to do what the group wants to do. I was also thinking that we could do, like tonight I was planning to do like a small groups, thinking even like two or three people, it's a little bit easier to have conversation and kind of scroll through policies together instead of like everybody trying to do it. Sure. Or um, the other possibility, number three, was sending these out like two weeks ahead of time so everybody has a chance to really look at your policies and like for me, I would prefer that way because I can really look at them, think about them, and it gives me time to kind of go through the policies. I also know that not everybody has the time. And then you know you would bring whatever you had to the meeting where we're going to discuss it, and then we can have a group discussion because there's been some prep work ahead of time. So my first question would be how folks wanted to do that going forward because I can we can make it work anyway. What everything is best. Well, I know what I want. That's not necessarily what's best. So you so. would prefer to do it, with, you know, have the scenario and I would prepare prefer to do for it, it, it on our own. a small role. group or asking people if they have time to prepare. Because well, we could. So tonight. So would so you for example, present I had it tonight? The answers, mm -hmm. And I had basically the direction of where to look for them in the policies. Mm -hmm. And even that took me a little bit of time to find mm -hmm. the language, of course. you know. So that it's just a matter of if people want homework or want to try to do it in 20 minutes. And I think we can have a pretty good conversation and kind of come up with the, the solution for the exercise. Yeah, so I mean, for this time, why don't for we this time, yeah. try it? We yeah. just try, try it. it. Yeah. And then, and then you can give us homework. Next time. Next time. Yeah. Also, um, I went online and I think there's a book that maybe the board might want to consider. It's, um, it's, it's like a practice book, which is probably where these came from. Oh, there's two pages. I apologize. So there's two pages. Okay. That would be fun. I think I think that would be interesting to go through I the book. Figured, it's like yeah. a dollar book, so I might. Oh, that's yeah. Worth that sounds worth it. Yeah. It. We've got money for. A okay. lot for board training, so. So I'll find the link and I'll just send it to you and I'll look at Sure. But I think it's basically what it is. And also, um, I've made two copies of the governance policies because I didn't know everybody would have them. And it's hard to do it without the policies in front of you. I do have the book here, too. Yes, the book right here. Um, that doesn't have the policies. This is the policy book. You guys. I got policy 2.7. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You do have 2.7. So, do we want to do it as a group because it's a fairly small? Sure. Oh, there's five of us. All right. And does anybody need. And I need to. Do you need the policies? Yeah. Do you have them not given this? those yet? Is I given this on the first day? You probably should have done it. I know. I have them on my phone. Well, it's a matter of if you physically have Seriously. them in front of you. I download them from the web. Download them from the OSSU website. <laughs> so I started with one that's relatively done. easy. Should she stay? Or should... You don't. Oh, you need don't. To stay. You don't have to stay. Here. I'm not going to take any actions. You'll let me know the time and get done. Yeah. Sure. Actually, yeah. if you take if you take the big bag, yeah, I do. it'll be my hero because I'm I got to drag this back too. <laughs> Your hero. <laughs> so, Lane, could you bring back these two since we haven't signed them? Yep. Okay. So. Yep. I don't know. I mean, Jim oh, and I have Yeah. Done. Oh, not, not a problem. Not everyone has signed them. As well. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you. And then don't forget your diplomas for homework. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thanks. 
hey, at least you'd have a graduating class like 450. Yeah, that's tough. Should, yeah. should, should be like delegating some of those to. <laughs> no. No. She can just stand. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> or auto, whatever. No, she'd Thank say you. like board. It would say board chair or. Yeah. So <laughs> other board member, <laughs> and she'd hand him around the room. Okay. So um, there's a scenario. That folks should read, or we can mm -hmm. read aloud. I mean, this one is about. Four, so, seven, four, seven. the scenario is reviewing an executive limitations monitoring report received in the mail. A board member questions whether the CEO's interpretation is in fact reasonable. How should she address her concern? So the first thing it asks is, what has the board already said in its relevant policies? And then it gives you the four sections, which would be ends, executive limitations, board management, delegation, or governance process. Okay. So, I guess so this I is where, to... yeah. <laughs> so we. The scenario is at the top. So would we start out with like each policy and go through each of them, like policy 2.0? Well, this is where, so we're talking about reasonable interpretation. Mm -hmm. Would that be in the ends? In other words, no. No. There did, you go. did you guys list, yep, list right. out what to do in this case right. in your policies and which policy would it be under? So do we have any policies in the executive limitations defining reasonable interpretation or how we would handle reasonable interpretation? So the executive limitations is what the superintendent can or cannot do. Right, and so you guess that that's where we would find. Right. Perhaps. Well, I would argue governance. The, yeah. Governance process, right? Right. I didn't know. I think you guys know this better than I do. I've been reading up on it. But sorry about that. No, that's okay. Smack me. So, this, so the question is, how should the board member address her concern? Yeah. Is there an executive limitation that tells the board member how to address? No. no. Okay. So that leads board management delegation and governance process. Sorry. So if you want to think, if you want to look at the start with the board management delegation, those policies, it's policies the threes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Would you like me to read those out loud for the other folks in the room who don't have them? All or? three policies? I can read them. Yeah. I think we don't. Do, oh. I don't think. Okay. We yeah. either have to read them all or yeah. not. And reading them all would be painful. Thank you. Painful. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't seem painful to me, but. That's fine. <laughs> it would be for the hearers. I hear that. <laughs> so why don't we I mean, start with if you, if you as a board member had a question about whether the superintendent's interpretation is reasonable, what would you do? Well, I would ask him. <laughs> um, and I would, I would review the you know, all the documenting mm -hmm. evidence that he was pre presenting to me in, you know, to back up whatever his, uh, his decision was. And, you know, then I guess I would, I would if I still did not think his, his uh, interpretation was reasonable, I think I would, you know, Go a little, dig a little deeper in his evidence. Maybe ask if Robin, had, you know, depends what it was. Whether it was the, you know, a financial thing that I, I would ask other people who were, you know, perhaps responsible, um, in part for him coming to this conclusion. You know, I think also that we would, as a board, need to, I would present my finding or my understanding to the board, and then we would have to d discuss it. So if you look into, um, it's, it's, we're talking about 
the governance process. Mm -hmm. This is where this is hard to do in a short time. Governing, where, where, so in the where governance where? process, process <laughs> the force, for? we talk about how um, board members yep. act and ways that they can um, interact with those. It's hard to do this without giving you the answers. So well, I mean, this is my first time. <laughs> I prep, but it's... They call it's well, also 4.1, it seems like, you know, we'll cultivate a sense of group responsibility, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. And we'll not use the expertise of individual members to substitute for the judgment of the board. Yep. So um, further in, there's also, um, it talks about CEO monitoring, and it talks, sorry, superintendent, I'm so sorry. That's okay. I we call the CEO. I use both languages. Interchangeable. It's okay. We're fine. We followed you. Okay. You're working with some bright people here. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you did all those things and you asked for the evidence and you still had a question about whether you still didn't feel like it was a reasonable interpretation, per our policies, you could ask the superintendent for additional information. Um, per our policies, if the superintendent felt like you were asking for um, an undue amount of work or whatever, he would probably say no and then, or request that it be brought to the board, board for discussion, which makes lots of sense. You also, as a board member, can ask for things to be put on the agenda. So per our policies, which is 4.3.3, a board member may request an item for board discussion mm -hmm. to be put on the agenda. So what they're saying is that if you have a question about this, you can bring it to the board, especially um, when you would think you'd be doing it when that particular monitoring report is being presented. Mm -hmm. And then you can bring it to the, ask to be on the agenda. And then at the board meeting, the board would discuss whether it was reasonable or not. We also state in our policies that the board is the final arbiter of reasonableness. Mm -hmm. And it's based on, um, I checked the language because I found this rather interesting because the reasonable person test has to be what your average person would consider reasonable. So even if we all were in agreement that we didn't feel it was reasonable, we would have to back that up by showing like most people. Most people would consider that. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm most saying. reasonable people. <laughs> which Not is crazy. Of, right. So which goes back to the board members being the voice of the people and mm -hmm. not being able to bring their own agenda. Personal biases. Yeah. Or, yeah. Gotcha. yeah. So, do you want me to just tell you where we, we go? Well, so for the governance process, it is collective decisions, which is 4.1.E. Well, it's 4.1, and then style. there's like an E. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Step up top there. You know, we're the ones responsible for making sure that the, the superintendent is achieving the ends and staying in compliance with the executive limitations. So this is all within our mm -hmm. job. We have the ability to request for something to be added to the agenda by um, talking to the chair. And then um, we have CEO monitoring on our schedule. Make sense. So, mm -hmm. yep. for governance process, if you guys want to go back and like look at them later, we are about, we're talking about 4.1e, 4.3.3, mm -hmm. 4.4.1, 4 mm -hmm. 4 and 4.3.5 are, are the policies that define our governance process for this issue. 4.3.5. I have a 4.3.5. Yeah. 
it's yeah, yeah it's super premiering monitoring here. will be included in the oh. agenda according to the oh, board my. schedule. I have a different <gasps> old version. Sorry, I down. This is fresh from the website. Yeah, <laughs> my, mine <laughs> December yeah. 2016. Oh, Mine's okay. the PDF downloaded from the mine website this afternoon. Oh eight. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder. <That's> right. <laughs> I'm struggling here. <laughs> Adam board chair, that is not good. <laughs> no. Gosh, I'm 10 years. Wow. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, and I think, so under the board management delegation, those are the policies 3.1 on. Yeah. We talked about a lot of these things. 3.3 is just to see if we can do it. You very clearly, 3.4 would say, yes, we can look at the executive limitations policies and shift them. If necessary. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's the next thing. We need to talk about latitude and stuff like that, so you can determine if it's necessary or if it's reasonable for the patient. Right, and um, so if the board decides that the superintendent's interpretation is reasonable, mm -hmm. you, you have to you know, support him in that. Mm -hmm. If we decide that if the board decides that the um, superintendent's interpretation is reasonable, but we've found, if, if some reason, like we strongly disagree, we can always change the change. policy, mm -hmm. like narrow the bowl yep. so that it's more specific or more limiting, which would limit, would then limit or, yeah, limit the um, superintendent's interpretation. Which would cause the interpretation to be more in line with our it would, it would expectation. narrow the interpretation, the ability of the superintendent right. to have an interpretation. So that's mm -hmm. like the whole like long drawn out process of what it could be, mm -hmm. depending on. Um, without stalling, without getting into means, without telling them, right. do it this way. Yeah, right. So right. Saying, All right, we want to narrow this down a little bit more. Yeah. And what's nice about it is it makes sure that it's a collective effort. Right? Yeah. It's coming from the board, not from which is good. Yep. Mm -hmm. So all of that is in the board management delegation. So we, we covered 3.1, which is only the decisions of the board or bindings on the superintendent. 3.3, um, which is allowing the superintendent to use reasonable interpretations. Right. Mm -hmm. um, when monitoring, we're the judge of the reasonableness, which is 3.4.3. And I can send this out too. Mm -hmm. And then the board is the final arbiter is 3.4.4. Makes sense? It does. does. Yeah. This is where I think even if people have time to leap ahead to kind of mm -hmm. scroll through it. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. you know it's hard mm -hmm. to do in twenty minutes to look through each one. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. It would be yeah. it would bring up lots of points for discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, so um the next question is, according to the, our policies, does this scenario refer to anything that has been delegated to the CEO? Because we're setting the, the limitations, and so we can't delegate what we're saying. That exactly. That we do. Yep. Yep. So does this scenario suggest that the CEO is in compliance with a reasonable interpretation of the board's ends and executive limitations policy? That's if yes. Right? Explain. So I said not applicable because we're not, yeah, we don't know if they are or not. We just know that a board member feels like it's an unreasonable right. interpretation. Mm -hmm. Then so if no, does the does this scenario reflect behavior consistent with the board's governance process and board management delegation processes? And it would seem like if we're having all these discussions, then yes. Yep, and it says each board member must decide if the monitoring report it receives demonstrates a reasonable interpretation of board policy. So it's just whenever those his inter his monitoring mm -hmm. reports come up with his interpretation, you want to just read it and make sure that when you vote to approve it, you're saying that it's reasonable. It's a reasonable interpretation and it's supported by it. Yep. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. 
So what action, if any, should the board or board member take now? Well, we already talked about that. Right. And so what the my fancy answer sheet says is, the board member has the right to ask the superintendent for information and should consider doing so. Mm -hmm. um, what they don't put in here is that the superintendent does have the power to say, you're asking me for a lot of stuff. It feels unreasonable, and then you would go back to the board. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, we would not do that. The board member will be aware that the board will re review the monitoring report at each board meeting, and the decision about the reasonableness of the superintendent <laughs> interpretation will be decided by the board as a whole. Right. And the board member should contact the chair to inform them that they want to discuss it in more detail at the next board meeting. Mm -hmm. so. And the final question is, if the action you propose involves a possible board policy change, what amendments or additions do you suggest? Or what further information do you need before deciding on this change? And we kind of talked about that, where it all depends. Right. On, I mean, we would have to be able to back up our our interpretation. I'm not saying it right. If we feel like it's unreasonable, if we feel like the superintendent's interpretation was reasonable, but we still don't, we still want to adjust policy, we would have to do that. We would have to change the mm -hmm. policy near right. the whole. Right. Right. If we feel like it is reasonable and the board as a whole agrees that it's reasonable, we just move forward to the next mm -hmm. thing. And if we feel like he has an unreasonable interpretation, then we Well, say. that's different. That's where if the board as a whole says it's an unreasonable interpretation, it would be a discussion at the meeting. I didn't think through that different like the other side of it. Mm. If we say it's unreasonable, when we submit it, like ask the superintendent to to do it again and make it reasonable, revise with yes. some guidance based upon on, the policy. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. To, to yeah, return to the policy. Yeah. I think we certainly wouldn't approve his monitoring. Certainly report. not. We might just table it after talking to the superintendent about the different pieces that we'd be looking for. And, and making then, sure and, we're on the same page. Right. Yeah. So, and but he also has the power to say, you know, this is reasonable, and you know, it's just a matter of who can back up which, mm -hmm. for what mm -hmm. steps need to be taken after. Right. I think so. Too. Okay. Well, I mean, I think having ongoing practice. And it's having a really to good use idea. these, mm -hmm. yeah, to having figure out what. To dig through the policies is oh, that's such a good idea. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just really think that otherwise, I mean, we don't do it. And um, so, you know, I propose that you, we continue to put you in charge every four, three, well, I think I we said like three times a year. 24 scenarios that I found. So, if, yeah. You, can, you don't mind doing this? Oh, I found them. She, she does it. She likes this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Could probably go out with the Monday, you know, how we have the Monday meeting, and then by the Thursday, the materials go out. Yeah. Maybe if we're going to do them, they go out with the materials. That way, people have a couple of That would days. be helpful. That would be really helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we'd yeah. become prepared. And, right. you know. and if you don't do one, you don't do one. You can still participate in the discussion. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that it's going right. to be the end of the world because you know it's going to be or more. Yeah, crazy busy than others. No, we're I don't all think it's an unreasonable fairly. expectation. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah. You know, for us to be doing. I enjoy it, so I'm biased. <laughs> 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 it's fun reading through the policies and finding. Oh, thank you. Where to go. Yeah. Okay. So, Paul, when we look and redo the annual agenda, let's you know, yeah, let's add those in in a periodic fashion. And we can, okay. Make sure it happens. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good. All so, right. Now I do believe we have no further business. It is nine o'clock exactly. All for right. Linda. Perfect. All right. Okay.